أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا ونبينا أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين ولا سيما بقية الله في الأرضين وحجته في العالمين روحي وأرواح العالمين لتراب مقدمه فداء واللعن الدائم على أعدائهم وغاصبي حقوقهم وجاحدي مناقبهم ومنكري فضائلهم من الآن إلى أبد الآبدين فعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم إن الذين اتخذوا العجل سينالهم غضب من ربهم وذلة في الحياة الدنيا وكذلك نجز المفترين صدق الله العلي العظيم اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد وعجل فرجهم الشريف I extend to you my greetings of peace and affection and thank you for watching my show we give all praise and glory to Allah our, our God our creator and we profess to him our faith as servants, as his worshippers, and as followers of his deen. I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he may give to all my viewers good health and prosperity in this life and the next. And may Allah, inshallah, tabarak wa ta'ala bless you all. Allahumma salla ala Muhammadin wa ala Muhammad wa ajjil farajahum wa sharif ya Allah, ya Allah, ya Allah. يا أرحم الراحمين يا أرحم الراحمين يا أرحم الراحمين يا محمود بحق محمد ويا عالي بحق علي ويا فاطر السماوات والأرضين بحق فاطمة الزهراء ويا محسن بحق الحسن ويا قديم الإحسان بحق الحسين نسألك ونقسمك صل على محمد وآل محمد وعجل لوليك الفرج اللهم عجل لوليك الفرج اللهم عجل لوليك الفرج اللهم عجل لوليك الفرج اللهم عجل لوليك الفرج اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد وعجل فرجهم We were discussing the topic of imamat in leadership and the uh, position of succession to the Nabi صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم and Shiism compared to the Omari school of thought at this stage, we are focusing on the inculcations and teachings of the Omri denomination with respect to the question of Imamah. The Omri theologians believe that the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alihi Wasallam neither appointed anyone to succeed him as the leaders of the Muslim community. As far as the period immediately after the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is concerned, nor did he appoint anyone for the coming generations and centuries and eras and epochs in which Muslim society would need a leader or leaders. So he did not specifically appoint anyone. On the other hand, they also maintained that the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam nor the Noble Qur'an left any instructions or directives through which the Ummah could know how the position of Imamah is filled and how a person becomes Imam and who is the Ummah to follow. So there is a total void in Islam. In the Umari version of Islam, there is a total void of instructions and teachings and directives from the Almighty Allah and all knowledgeable Allah and his uh, Prophet, the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alihi Wasallam as far as the question of Imama is concerned. So if Allah didn't give any directives and the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alihi Wasallam did, did not leave any directives and instructions, any formula, formula through which the Ummah would determine who its Imam is, nor the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Wasallam or Allah appoint specific persons, specific individuals on the position of Imamah. How is Ummah to determine 
who to, who to follow and who is their imam is and what are the rulings of imama. These are very interesting questions that Omri theologians need to address and answer. Before I elaborate these points, inshallah wa ta'ala, and prove to you that indeed that is the case in the Omri denomination, that they have alleged Almighty Allah of um, not guiding the Ummah and the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa wasallam depriving the Ummah of his instructions. Before I reach there, inshallah tabaraka wa ta'ala, I'll continue my two previous lectures on the subject in which I said how the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa wasallam before his demise, how did he perceive the world ahead of, after his demise? How did he perceive the future? And I Mentioned to you that the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam addressed the people of Baqi and said that you are lucky, you are so fortunate that you have left this world and went and joined the eternal abode because there will be days coming, there will be times coming that they would be like blankets of night, um, fitan and mischiefs and times of tra travesty and debauchery in transgression like blankets of night, one after the other, consecutively or continually will come. And the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that Islam was in initially a loner religion with very few followers. And very soon Islam again will turn to be a loner religion with very few followers and Islam and its teachings and its followers would recede and become very scant and few between the two mosques of Mecca and Medina, just like a snake recedes into its hole. And then the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's position, his views, which his views obviously are in jibe with the views of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and is consistent with reality in truth, and that is reality in truth. His, his statements with regard to Sahaba, that, that Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, an uncountable number of ahadith narrated on the authority of most reliable Sahaba and most reliable scholars of hadith in the Umari denomination, the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam professed that his Sahaba will turn apostate immediately after him. And their apostasy would not be on the account of them changing their religion, rather on the account of two things. One, innovations, changing the pristine teachings of Islam and introducing their own innovations as the, the orders and canons of Islam into the Sharia of Islam, which we call bid'ah. And second, that they would strive to achieve worldly pleasures and worldly status. And in the previous lectures, and detail, not in just quite as much as detail that perhaps it's possible, but in a detail that's sufficient for this audience, I presented to you these hadith and these narrations from the four most reliable books of the Omari denomination. Likewise, in the previous two lectures, you would, I told you that the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentioned that that his Sahaba and his Ummah will follow the pathways of the previous nations of Bani Israel and Nasara. And we know the transgressions and the abuse that Bani Israel brought upon their, their religions and rather religions of Allah, that the same would be pursued and followed and emulated in this nation by a Sahaba. And, and that these assertions of the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and his prognostications and predictions, they definitely encompass Sahaba I, and it's not 
exclusive of, ex exclusive of Sahaba and pertinent to real, uh, later generations, I brought extensive amount of evidence to that regard. So I urge those brothers and sisters who have not watched the previous lectures to inshallah wa ta'ala watch those lectures with great care and with great att attention. Now we proceed further. How did the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam before his demise, how does he see through his divine eyes, through his divine wisdom and through the insight and knowledge and perception that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has, gr has granted his Habib sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, how did he perceive the world? How Allah in his knowledge knew the world that, that is to come after the demise of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. If it's a hunky-dory time to come, if it's a very rosy time to come, and people are so pious and God-fearing and their life is such blissful that there is no need for the appointment of an imam and a spiritual guide and someone who would be the guardian and caretaker of the ummah, that would be one case. Then one would could see that it's perhaps because the coming times are so good and so pleasant, devoid of any conflict, devoid of any sort of challenge to religion, devoid of any attempts to bring in, in innovations into religion, then perhaps, perhaps one may suggest that as such, there wouldn't be need for the appointment of an imam. But that's not the case. That is not the case. The Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam if you keep into perspective what I've already presented to you, the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam paints a very bleak and grim picture of the future. And in such a case, it would be unimaginable that the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would not have the foresight, nor Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would have the wisdom and foresight to either leave clear instructions with respect to imama that you can select or elect or appoint or, or uh, choose your imam or that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself through his infinite wisdom, he would appoint someone to succeed the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But what's perplexing what's, uh, and what is very self-evidently wrong and unimaginable is the fact that no, the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, both knowing all these facts, leave this huge blind, uh, 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 blind spot, this huge area of darkness and ignorance and lack of guidance and lack of any instructions. And that would be the question of Imama. So, another set of a hadith with respect to the future immediately after the demise of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This book is Al Musannaf li Abdul Razak al Sanani, one of the foremost respectable and reliable and credible authors of hadith, and he is of the generations that precedes Bukhari in Muslim. And generally, Bukhari in Muslim have narrated uh, from obviously from Abdul Razak, but they usually narrate with one or two, one or two intermediaries between them. So he is. Uh, he precedes Bukhari and Muslim uh, with, a, with one or two generations of, of, uh, of transmitters of hadith. In this book of Al Musannaf, volume number 10, published by Al Maktab al Islami in 1983, page number 156, hadith number 18,675, Abdul Razak narrates. From Ma'amar, who narrates from Qatada, قال سأل النبي صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم عبد الله بن سلام كم ت على كم تفرقت بنو إسرائيل. That the Nabi صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم inquired from Abdullah ibn Salam into how many denominations and sects and parties did بنو إسرائيل split after uh, did بنو إسرائيل split. So Abdullah ibn Salam said, Ala wahida aw ithnatayna wa sab'ina firqa. He said either 71 or 72 sects and parties. Faqal, 
Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, wa ummati aidan sataftariqu mithluhum. He said, likewise my nation, my ummah will split and will divide into the say into like like Bani Israel will divide into different sects. Aw yazidun wahida or they they will even generate one more sect. The number of denomination and sects that Muslims would split to would be more than Bani Israel. And then the next clause in this hadith, the next segment should be a ring bell of uh, warning for any Muslim that the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said kulluha fin nar illa wahida all of these denominations of Muslims they are condemned to the inferno of hell except one denomination so all the sects of Islam that you see and all of these sects are condemned all of them are dis- destined for hell for the eternal damnation of the Lord, except one sect. Now this hadith has been narrated in the books of our brethren and also in our books through myriads of chains of narration. I present to you Kitab al-Sunan Libni Majah al-Qazvini, volume number two, published by Darul Ta'asil at the year 2014. There is in Sunan Ibn Majah, there is a chapter called Babu Iftiraq al Umam, the chapter of the uh, division of various nations, divisions of the various nations. In this chapter, hadith, the first hadith, which, which would be hadith number 4020, Abu Hurairah narrates that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, تفرقت اليحود على إحدى وسبعين فرقة وتفترق أمتي على ثلاث وسبعين فرقة. That the Jewish they split into seventy one uh, parties and denominations, and my ummah will divide into seventy three sects denominations. The next hadith is on the authority of Auf ibn Malik who said. That Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, If taraqat al Yahudu ala ihda wa sabina firqa, Banu Israel split into 71 uh, sects. Fawa hidatun fin jannati wa sabuna fin nar. One of those sects is fortunate to enter paradise and the rest go to hell, uh, and 70 of them go to hell. Waf taraqat al Nasara ala thintain wa sabina firqa. In Nasara, the Christians, they split into 72 sects. فَإِحْدَى وَسَبْعِينَ فِي النَّارِ وَوَاحِدَةٌ فِي الْجَنَّةِ 72 of those, uh, 71 of those are condemned to fire of hell and one would be entering Jannah. وَالَّذِي نَفْسُ مُحَمَّدٍ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَالِي وَسَلَّمْ بِيَدِهِ I swear by that Lord in whose, whose hands is the life and soul of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. لَتَفْتَرِقَنَّ Indeed. أُمَّتِي عَلَى ثَلَاثَ وَسَبْعِينَ فِرْقًا Indeed, my umm will split into 73 sects, 73 denominations. فَوَاحِدَةٌ فِي الْجَنَّةِ وَثِنْتَانَ وَسَبْعُونَ فِي النَّارِ And only one would find salvation into Jannah into the gardens of the Lord, into paradise. And 72 of them are condemned to the inferno of hell. Ya Rasulullah. It was asked, Who are those? Qala al Jama'ad. He said, the, the group. Now, obviously, Al Jama'a saying that Al Jama'a, this. It's not very descriptive. There should be better description than this, better explanation than this, that who is the Jama'ah? Obviously, this is, um, amount of explanation that they are the Jama'ah, they are the group. Which group? Uh, that blessed group that out of all these 73 nations, 73 denominations, that only denomination is to be blessed with entering the paradise. And the Lord would be pleased with him. So it requires more, more explanation. 
But that's not our purpose to identify right now which denomination that is, which is to be uh, to f find salvation. Obviously, the Nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam, in myriad of ahadith and very repetitive and mutawatir ahadith, has pronounced clearly that I leave behind two mighty things. So long as you cling unto them and follow them, you will never ever go astray. And those two mighty things are Quran and Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam. So these, these sorts of hadith that the followers of Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam are guaranteed by the words of Allah and by the words of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They are guaranteed salvation and they are guaranteed that they will never go astray. They obviously and clearly uh, uh, give us clear uh, um, demonstration as who that in which de de denomination that is which out of the 73 would be on the right path but that is not our purpose right now our purpose is the following that the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam knowingly and and he does not obviously he does not profess these statements on as as a person himself he professes these these words as the messenger of Allah. So Allah in his infinite knowledge and Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as his, as his guide and as his uh, torchbearer, as the teacher of this ummah, he clearly defines a very bleak future for the Muslims that the majority of Muslims will go astray. And now, obviously, if there are times that are coming that people will go astray and the majority of what ummah will go astray, it demands the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam leaves clear caretakers after him of the ummah, of the ummah who, who's, if you follow them, if you listen to them, if you cling unto their teachings, that you would not go astray. And for the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa, alayhi wa sallam just to die knowing all these facts and knowing that he will die and Allah knowing all these facts and knowing that the these times are coming and he takes the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam away from this dunya without addressing the most pressing need of this ummah that is unimaginable that's that defies common sense that can that cannot be the case okay And then let's have a look at the following hadith. Hadith number 4022 in the same chapter. Anas ibn Malik narrates in Bani Isra Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said Bani Israel iftaraqat ala ahda wa sab'ina firqa wa inna ummati sataftariqu ala thintayna wa sab'ina firqa kulluha finnar illa wahida wa hiya al-jama'a. Banu Israel, the children of Israel, they split into 71 sects and my followers will, will split into 72 sects and all of them will be in fire of hell except one nation and that is the group, that is the Jama'ah. Okay. Now are these ahadith valid or they are not reliable? Let's have a look. Okay. The book of Sahih Sunan Ibn Majah Lil Hafiz. Abi Abdullah Muhammad ibn Yazid al-Qazvini verified and investigated and validated by the very uh, severely Wahhabi scholar Muhammad Nasir Din al-Albani. Volume number three published in Al-Riyadh at the year 1997. Page number 307, the Babu Iftiraq al the first hadith I showed you, Hassan and Sahih, Hassan and Sahih, the second hadith I Read and translated for you is Sahih. The third hadith in this regard is also Sahih. Okay. So all these hadith that I narrated to you, they were Sahih. Now let me present to you uh, the English translation of these hadith as translated by our brethren in Islam, the followers of the leadership of Omar. This is Sunnah.com. Sunan ibn Majah, Kitab al-Fitan, Babu Iftiraq al-Umam, The Division of Nations. Excuse me. Okay, the first hadith. 
Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said the Jews split into 71 sects and my nation will split into 73 sects. Okay. Next hadith. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said the Jews split into 71 sects. One of which will be in paradise and 70 in hell. The Christians have split into 72 sects, 71 of which will be in hell and one in paradise. I swear by the one in whose hands is the soul of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. My nation will split into 73 sects, one of which will be in paradise and 72 in hell. It was said, O Messenger of Allah, who are they? He said, the main body. The main body. He said, al jamaa al jamaa does not mean the, the main body. al jamaa means the group. So, um, the translator of this hadith has tried to convey that the majority, the main body, meaning the majority of Muslims, that whoever is in majority, they are the jama'ah, and they would be, they would be, um, they would, they would enter paradise. However, jama'ah doesn't mean that. Jama'ah jama simply means the group. Jama'ah does not mean the main body. Rather, there is no indication in these ahadith that there will be 73 sects, sects and the main body of, will be the majority. There is no indication in these ahadith. That, as far as these ahadith are concerned, the, 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 the group, the denomination that will enter paradise could be a small group, could be a big group, could be the majority, could be the minority. It, 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 there's no, uh, there is no uh, um, indication as far as the numbers are concerned in this. What we know for a fact that 72 is the majority, right? 72 is probably more than, than one group. And they will all go to fire of hell. Okay. Now, because you saw this, that, um, and the last hadith that I read to you from Sunan ibn Majid, it would be appropriate to show you the translation as well. Kitab Sunan ibn Majid. Okay. The children of Israel split into 71 sects, and my nation will split into 72, all of which will be in hell apart from one, which is the main body. So, excuse me, which is the main body? Excuse me. Okay. Sahih. So they have said it's Sahih. So, Al Jama'ah, they, they have translated Jama'ah as the main body. And that is wrong. And that is because, because the translators of these ahadith, either they are biased or they are trying to portray one sect, which is a majority, portray them as the, 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 the sect that is going to be fortunate to end, uh, to end up in paradise. However, let's have a look in the books of hadith. What, what, when the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, al-jama'ah, the group, what does it literally mean? What does it really mean? This book is Tahdeeb al-Kamal fi Asma'i al-Rijal, volume number 22, published by Al-Mu'assa al-Risala at the year 1992. Now, this is one of the uh, very important books that is an encyclopedia, the most encompassing, perhaps, the most encompassing and inclusive and vastest encyclopedia of narrators of hadith in the Umari denomination. And perhaps no research of a hadith um, is devoid of need to this book. At this book, at page number 264, there's a discussion between Abdullah ibn Mas'ud and uh, a person. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud says, Tadrim al -jama Abdullah al Mas'ud said, Do you know what is jama'ah? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, The jama'ah will be, the group will be uh, blessed to go to paradise. Who are they? I said, No. Qala inna jamhur al jama'ah al ladina faraku al jama'ah. Al jama'ah tu ma wafaq al haq wa in kunta wahdak. He said the majority of the jama'ah have abandoned the jama'ah. Majority of the nation of Muslim, Muslims, they have abandoned the jama'ah. The majority have abandoned the jama'ah. Jama'ah, 
ما الجماعة ما وافق الحق وإن كنت وحده. جماعة doesn't have to do anything with numbers. Even if you're one person, if you are in concert with the with truth, if you are in accord with the teachings of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, even if you're one person, you are that jama'ah. Jama'ah doesn't have anything to do be with main body or the fringe body or being at the peripheries. Jama'ah could be one person. Jama'ah could be 10 people. Numbers doesn't have to do anything with it. As long as you are on the right path, وفي رواية in another narration عبد الله بن مسعود رضي الله تعالى عنه and he is one of the respected sahaba of the Nabi صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم ويحكى إن جمهورا الناس فارق الجماعة he said the majority of people at his time and that is quite a startling revelation for, uh, not for the Shias for the, but for our brethren in Islam that at the time of Sahaba, Sahaba are testifying at that time that the Jumhur of Nas, the majority of the Muslim society, they have abandoned the right path. So all this talk that you hear from our brethren in Islam about the Salaf, following the Salaf, following the Salaf. Salaf themselves have testified that the majority of Salaf, they were not on the right path. So Abdullah ibn Mas'ud said the majority of people who is talking about the majority of people? Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, at Abdullah ibn Mas'ud's time, the majority of people at the time of Uthman, at the time of Omar, at those times, they were Muslims in Medina, Muslims in Mecca, Muslims in Bahrain, Muslims in Yemen, Muslims in Iraq. So Syria, these Muslims, he's talking about them. They are not on the right path. The majority of people have abandoned the Jama'ah, the right path. Inna al-Jama'ah ma wafaqa ta'at Allah Azza wa Jalla. Jama'a is that person or those people. Doesn't have anything to do with numbers or being ma the main body or at the peripheries. Jama'a is whoever follows the, the teachings of Allah, the message of Allah. If you, are, if you are in accord with the teachings of Quran and the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, then you are the jama'a. قال حميد بن زنجويه قال نعيم بن حماد في هذا الحديث نعيم بن حماد is one of the masters of hadith on the authority of whom Bukhari Muslim and many others narrate so he said that this hadith means إذا فسدت الجماعة فعليك بما كنت عليه الجماعة قبل أن تفسد, تفسد وإن كنت وحدك فإنك أنت الجماعة حينئذ this narration means that if the majority of Muslims, the main body, the society of Muslims, they go astray, you should not go astray. And you should follow that path that Muslims followed before going astray. And in that case, you, you will be the jama'ah, even if you're one person. You, one loner person, you are the jama'ah. Ibn Taymiyyah has a student, his name is Ibn Qayyim al jawziya He is a very well-known uh, scholar and researcher and author, and his authorships are extensive, and he is ex ex especially respected and revered by the Wahhabi and Salafi uh, uh, community. This is his book, A'lam al muwaqqiin Volume number five, uh, uh, authored by Ibn Qayyim al jawziya who died in the year 751, uh, published in 1423 and Hijaz in Saudi Arabia. Page number 388, he has a long discussion that goes beyond one page, and I'll just read you one line. Uh, one line or two. وَعَلَمْ أَنَّ الْإِجْمَاعَ وَالْحُجَّةَ وَالسَّوَادَ الْعَعْزَمْ Beware that ijma, consensus, hujja. Many of you who, are Muslim, who have been Muslims long or coming from Islamic background, you know what hujja means. So I don't need to translate proof. As sawad al azam the main, sawad means black, the, the big black. Literally, it means the big black. As sawad al azam means the big black. 
So if you look at a body of people at the army, at its ranks, army formation from a distance, it looks like a dark uh, gathering. When you come close, you find it's an army. As Sabad al Adam, the big formation of people. So that means, a, Sabad means people, a gathering of people. As Sabad al Adam, the bigger, the greater community of Muslims. So, what is Ijma consensus? What is Hujjah? What is As Sabad al Adam? As Sabad al Adam, the greater community of Muslims. It's, it doesn't have to do, these terminology doesn't have to do anything with numbers. That you would count people who is more. No. It doesn't have anything to do with these. Whoever is in accord with the teachings of Allah and Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, even if they are minority. So beware that ijma, hujja, sawad al adam These words apply to who? Who is the person who, who's, these are his, Attributes. This is, the, this is not the majority of Muslims. No, Sawad al Adam. He is the alim. He is that guide that who is the flag bearer of the truth. Alim sahib al haq. Wa in kana wahda. Even if he is one person. Wa in khalafu ahlul ard. If all of humanity, all of the people of earth are against him and defy him and disagree with him, doesn't make any difference. If he is. On the path of Allah, if his words, his actions, his positions, his views, his pronouncements are in accord with Quran and the sayings of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he is ijma, he is hujjah, hujj, he is the sawad al adam he one person. Okay? So jama'a, doesn't have anything to do with this. With, with, With the translation that you saw in the jama'ah means the main body of Muslim, that's not true. Uh, at any rate. Uh, so the, these sets of ahadith that have been narrated, that the Muslim ummah will split into 73 sects and all of them will be destined to fire of hell. These ahadith have been narrated by the um, Umaris um, through reliable chains of narration. And these ahadith are sahih. And I've shown you only a few. There are many more ahadith than this. So, if the majority of people of earth, and I'm, I'm, my, my apologies, if the majority of Muslims out of 73 sects, 72 will, will not be on the right path and they will go astray, so much so that they will be condemned to fire of hell. And only one denomination, they would be blessed with entry to paradise. Now we all know that divisions of Muslims into different sects has happened on the account of the leaders they have followed. It's not being on the account of people. The, the people themselves, common Muslims, they do not cause splits. They do not cause uh, divisions of the Ummah into different sects. Division into sects and, de de uh, and denomination, this occurs because of the people following different Imams and because of their different teachings and because of different interpretations of the deen and because of different narrations and that's quite clear so all of these divisions that have occurred and because of these divi occurrence of these divisions muslims have gone astray so much so that they are worthy of the wrath of the lord and they will be condemned to inferno of hell on account of imama yet <laughs> imama ya rasulullah if you know so much that imama we, we, we all you know so much. You are saying that these things will occur. Then why? You do not leave clear instructions. Whom should Muslims follow? So these divisions would not occur. These, these uh, splits into various denominations would, would not occur. This is Al-Musnad li Ahmad ibn Hanbal investigated by Ahmad ibn Muhammad Shakir Published by Darul Hadith in Qahira, volume number eight, published in year 1995. As you know, Sheikh Ahmed Muhammad Shakir is revered by Asha'ira and by the Salafis alike.
So page number 301, same hadith from Abu Huraira, that Muslims would divide into 72 sects, and everybody, 72 sects, has been narrated, and it's Sanad is Sahih. And Even the Habi has, has um, mentioned that this hadith is Sahih. Uh, consider this Al Mustadak Al Sahihain, volume number one, published by Darul Kutub Al Alimiya at the year 2002. Let's go to hadith number. Uh, 443, page number 218. The Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in ahl al kitabi tafarraku fi dinim ala thintain wa sabin millah wa taftariku ahadi al um ala thalatha wa sabin kulha fi nar illa wa hida. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said the ahl al kitab, followers of the book, they split in their religion into 71 nations and this umma will split into 73. All of them are in hell except one nation. After narrating these ahadith and ahadith alike, Hakim says, هذه, هذه He says, this hadith has been narrated through, through so many various chains of narration that obviously this hadith is sahih and this hadith is hujjah. And in the footnote, the hadith number 443, in Talkhis al some, uh, Synopsis of Mustadrak, uh, summary of Mustadrak, Dhahabi says, Hadi Asanidu Takumu Bihal Hujja. These Asanid definitely prove the point, prove this hadith is indeed Sahih. And there are many other. Uh, I do not bore you with more um, evidence in this regard. So, division of Ummah into 73 sects, 72 of them who would be in fire of hell, is a Sahih hadith. And one nation would be saved. And, and the, the fact to retain in mind is that these divisions have not occurred because of Quran. These divisions have not occurred because of Sunnah. These divisions have occurred because of leadership, because of people causing, people in position of leadership causing divisions. So if leadership was not addressed by the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, then he indeed did not care about his ummah. I mean, if Allah did not um, uh, did not give any instructions with respect to imama and kept Muslims in darkness, and imama leadership is the cause of all these divisions, then obviously Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not do a complete job of guiding this ummah. Okay. I think I should not bore you with more, um, with more um, address. So I, I suffice on this, what I've addressed today, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. So let's keep my lecture brief, the 45, 43, 45 minutes of lecture so far is enough. I assume I'm not going to start another set of hadith relevant to this topic. Uh, I'll inshallah tabarak wa ta'ala now will take your calls. Do I have any calls? Would anybody would like to call me? Okay, so if you want to call me, brothers and sisters, there are two ways to call me. You can use a regular phone, or you may call me through uh, WhatsApp. Landline calls or cell phone calls, which ring here on landline. The numbers are there on, on the screen. One is a number for the UK, a local number that rings in our studio in the US. And then we, we have a a an, uh, a U.S. number as well, and the number with area code nine one seven that is a WhatsApp number if you'd like to call. Okay, we have a caller from uh, the Emirates. Go ahead, brother Emirates. Yeah, salam alaikum. Who is with me? Hello. Hello. Who's calling? Hello. Salam alaikum. Alaikum assalam. Yola, how are you? My name is Amtiaz. I actually am calling from Bombay, India. Okay. <clears throat> the WhatsApp number is of UAE. Mm -hmm. What's the word? How are you, Kibla? Very well, thank you. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. May Allah bless you. May Allah bless you. 
मैं इमा आई मालिक सलाम कीप यू सेफ कीप योर फैमिली सेफ ब्लेस यू कीबला यू आर डूइंग अ ग्रेट जॉब यू आर डूइंग अ ग्रेट जॉब आई एम वाचिंग यू सिंस अ लॉन्ग टाइम एंड आई रियली एडमायर यू माय एंटायर फैमिली एंड ऑल एंड इवन माय मॉम इज वेटिंग टू सी दिस बिकॉज़ शी वांटेड मी टू स्पीक विद यू एंड इवन इवन शी इज वाचिंग द प्रोग्राम लाइव नाउ माशाल्लाह मे अल्लाह ब्लेस यू ऑल इट्स क्वाइट क्वाइट लेट इन बॉम्बे इज इट That I was waiting for your call, Kibla. I was waiting for your call. It's already across across three thirty. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, three thirty, three four o'clock in the morning. Yeah. Okay. What can I do for yeah, you, brother? Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you for encouragement. Thank you Kibla, for watching. I, I, yeah. yeah. I'd like to tell you something about my family, Kibla. Yeah. Like uh, we are Sayyids, but maybe because of some takia reason, we were not where. Now I am forty seven, forty eight. When I mm-hmm. was twenty two, you know, it was in my family, especially in my mom, that you know, mm-hmm. uh, what to say. Uh, about Imam Ali, you know, Nianas towards him, Ahlul Bayt. She used to talk about them and all. And okay. at the age of twenty-four, I started researching. Okay. And uh, then I became a Shia. Then my entire family became Shia. Mm-hmm. We are three brothers, one sister. Uh, mm-hmm. That time they were small, uh, younger to me. I'm the elder one. Okay. Now mm-hmm. they all have kids, so it's a new generation of Shia. And I went back where we came mm-hmm. from. I went to Hyderabad and all. and there i came to know that we had an imam barga which was owned by our ancestors okay so like it was a great okay. journey and at that time where i am staying in bombay there were people against us there used to be meeting in the mosque against us saying that there is an entire family who who they have converted they became shia okay mm-hmm. and uh, once there was a plan to attack Also on us, they called us for a manazra to talk okay, with me. Okay, okay, uh, uh, yeah. Th- thank you, sir. Thank you. May Allah bless you. It's we uh, your family background might be interesting, and, 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 but say, tell us something that that yeah, that's for me. May Allah bless you. I just want to pray for you, Kibla. Okay, thank you. May, May Allah bless you. you. I pray for you. Allah keep you well. God bless and, you. Thank and, you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I have a caller here from the UK. Uh, go ahead. Uh, UK caller. Salam alaikum. Who is with me? UK phone caller. Go ahead. And hello. Yes, sir. What can I do for you? Who's calling? Yes, uh, hi. Salam alaikum. Uh, my name is Salman. I spoke to you yesterday as well. Uh, uh, Kibla, I have. Uh, Uh, I did mention to you about the setting up the PayPal thing and all that. Uh, if your operator can get in touch with me, I have some details no, no, I can operator, uh, uh, share with them. Operator, operator is not operator is not involved in donations. So PayPal, I don't I don't think there's any problem for anybody in the UK to mm-hmm. be able to donate to my PayPal account. I think that they do yeah. it and it happens. Yeah. So why why should they use your PayPal account? No, I mean uh, a bank account can be set up as well, but which can be dedicated to this cause, and uh, the PayPal account can then transfer the money over towards yours. Uh, that was the idea behind it. So, so I mean, this is something I already consider, have a and, PayPal account. May Allah bless you. The PayPal account is also visible on the screen right now. So they uh-huh. should be able, if someone wants to donate, they should be able to donate directly to my PayPal account. May Allah keep you well. And if somebody wants to okay. use a, a a debit card instead of a PayPal account, a debit card or a or a, or a credit card, donations on on my PayPal account through debit cards is possible. Also on my website, they can, which is also uh, uh, if you want a description of this video, they can go there and they could deposit money directly into my account. I don't think there's a problem in the UK. Because most UK debits, debit cards, I understand, they have the they Visa work, logo yes. or Mastercard agree, yes. logo. Yes. As long as, as long as of the Visa logo and Mastercard logo, they should be able to donate directly to my account. May Allah bless you. But, okay, but if someone wants to deposit uh, cash, then deposit cash into an account in UK. So if there's a need for that, if there's a need for that, then I'll let you know, Brother Salman. Perfect. Okay. Uh, can I move on to? I have got three small questions. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, first one is regarding to what you've just been discussing the hadith with regarding to seventy-two sex. Uh, yeah. 
My idea uh, or my opinion about is, I don't know if I could be wrong or right, that's why I'm asking you, that mm-hmm. when uh, the Prophet Wasallam said that it's going to be 72 sects and only one of the group would be the one which will uh, get his shafat. Now, my idea behind it, which I think is that it may not be uh, the worldly defined sects which are there. For example, Ismailis, Zaydis, or Deobandis, or Hanafis. Rather, it would be a sect on its own, which has certain values, certain fellowship towards Ahlul Bath, which will take them towards to form that one sect, which will go to Jannah. So that is my first question. Okay. Uh, do you want me to ask you the other two questions as well? Or do you want to answer this first? Just ask me one qu- more question and then I'll, 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 I'll let you go, okay? One more question. Okay. The other question is regarding the tattoos, yeah? Uh, mm-hmm. We have got uh, a British Iraqi, very famous, um, uh, Sayyid Ahmad Akshwani. He's very well known here in, in yeah. British uh, Shia community. Yeah. Uh, he's got tattoos uh, on him, yeah? yeah. Yeah. And uh, I just want your opinion with regards to tattoos and stuff. Uh, that uh, what's your opinion is, and what do hadiths, uh, you know, okay. uh, guide right. us about? Okay. Thank that. you. May Allah bless you. May Allah bless you. Allah oh. keep you well. Yeah. Thank okay. you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Allah so, with regard to uh, May Allah bless you. With regard to uh, the question of um, tattoo uh, of firqa, the sex denominations, the ummah will split in two. The Nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam did not specify how and what these what would be the uh, qualities of these uh, various uh, denominations if he did then it's not narrated to us if he did explain in more detail he gave the example of bani israel and christians before muslims that they also split into many sects and many denominations obviously uh there's a point of reference and the point of reference is the Bani Israel, children of Israel, and Christians. And how they divided into the various sects was because uh, difference in belief, following different people, difference interpretation of the books of authority, and also practices. So some, uh, if you ask one um, sect, they would say that Catholics have added to the Bible. If you ask the Catholics, they would say Baptists, perhaps, they have eliminated teachings from the Bible. And Protestants, they have gone astray. So perhaps, so they, they would not agree with, any, with each other. Uh, so it would be the same in Islam, similar in Islam. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that Muslims would follow the example of Christians and Jews before them. So these division of sects will be similar to that. So what you are referring to, that, that this sect perhaps re- refers to something else, I do not agree with you. These are denominations, these are parties, groups within Islam that would be split from one another and their beliefs would be different, their practices would be uh, dissimilar to one another. Okay, and now your question about tattoos. So, we, um, ta- there is one hadith that says that a woman who does tattoo, tattoo, tattoo she is condemned with la'an, a woman who does a tattoo. Now, uh, it's not clear to us. With regard to men, there is nothing. There is nothing. I've tattoos with regard to men, with m- women. But it's, it's not really clear to me whether it's because of tattoo, the fact that they did tattoo on them, they are condemned with land, damnation, or because these were women of low character. And these women of low character they had tattoos on them, women who would be prostitutes, or women who would uh, be of, of, of very vulgar character. So that's not clear to me. Um, there is not a great stress in a hadith with regard to forbidding t- tattoos. It's quite possible that the hadith in which there is land of women with tattoo, it is because that these, not because they did tattoo, but because it was a sim- sign and symbol of women, of being vulgar and being of bad character. Okay, we have a caller here. Uh, what happened to our caller? Uh, here we go. We have a caller here. 
Okay, what's up, caller? Go ahead, please. Salam alaikum. Salam alaikum wa rahmatullah, Sheikhna. How are you? May Allah bless you. Allah keep you well. Who is with me? Uh, my name is Haider. I'm calling from London. Yes, Haider. How are you doing? Uh, very good. Thank you, Sheikhna. Sheikhna, I, had, uh, uh, I had one or two questions, if possible. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. The first one was uh, within. Um, as in this is sort of a misconception, you could say, or uh, misinformation, not only amongst the Sunni, uh, but also amongst our own Shia brethren. Um, mm -hmm. So they say after the the burial of the Holy Prophet, after the demise, after Safifa, um, the, why did the Muslims who were present at Ghadir uh, not stand up? Um, I was wondering if you could touch upon how okay, Abu this Bakr... is this is very very clear. Most people always don't do the right thing. It's yeah. a very it's a very very um, uh, how should I say a very very um, uh, foolish expectation. I was wondering if in, in particular could you touch upon oh, please sorry, yeah. allow me. It's a very foolish expectation to expect people always to do the right thing, or the majority of people do the right thing. There are many examples before us. Uh, people who uh, killed Imam Hussein alayhi salam. They were from this ummah. They knew. Many of them were sahaba. They had seen the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam profess love and express his, his affection, extreme affection, intense affection for Imam Hussein alayhi salam. And the rest of them were all tabi'een. And they all knew that Imam Hussein alayhi salatu wa sallam is innocent and he is a man of impeccable character. And there was no dispute. No charge against Imam Hussein alayhi salam. There was no dispute that Imam Hussein alayhi salatu wasalam has done some uh, misdeed. Therefore, he deserves to be put to sword. If there was any any confusion about Imam Hussein alayhi salam, there was no confusion about his children, about his young little baby. Yet we know by the thousands Muslims surrounded Imam Hussein alayhi salam's camp, and they massacred. His children yeah, massacred his his brothers, massacred his uh, his followers. Very, they were very few, a small group, seventy people, and then they trampled his body. they not just his body; they're all their bodies under the hoofs of the horses. Oh, and they knew, and they knew who Imam Hussein alayhi salam was. So it was not because they didn't know. Of course, they knew, but pe people who know facts all it's it, when when their their interest calls. Or if they are pushed to to a certain way by their leaders, people do wrong things. Or when Hazrat Musa alayhi salam, the Nabi Musa alayhi salam, he went to the mount. Bani Israel, he instructed Bani Israel to follow uh, his brother Aaron. And as soon as he left, Bani Israel, who had seen these miracles, these great and splendid miracles, fantastic miracles, from Musa alayhi salam, just as his stick. Turning, his walking his stick turning into a serpent, and then drowning of Pharaoh, who was a superpower at the time. He had a mighty army, and Bani Israel, all of them had been turned into slaves. So Pharaoh would would uh, would slaughter and behead small babies, young baby boys from Bani Israel. So Musa alayhi salam was that hero, that leader, that who had who had taken out his nation from under the yokes of slavery of Pharaoh and had Pharaoh destroyed and drowned. And these were the same nation that for them, when they traveled in the desert, um, clouds would provide shade for them as an act of miracle, as an act of blessing. And roasted birds, roasted birds would come to them for their lunch and dinner. Roasted from heavens, Allah will these brought for them heavenly food. Yet these same people, as soon as Moses alayhi salam went to the mount, they decided, David decided to worship a calf made of metal, a metallic calf, which didn't have, which didn't perform any supernatural, uh, supernatural miracles, nothing. There was nothing extraordinary about it. They decided to do, do that. In the previous lecture, I told you that Bani Israel, they came to Moses السلام, and said to them, make for, build for us a, an idol. So why people do wrong things? Why do people do wrong things? Right now, right now, if you 
like a lot of scholars who pertain, who belong to the other denomination, when they talk to me and yeah. I explain to them, and everybody knows that they don't have any answer. They don't have any yeah. answer. And, and they cannot, it's they cannot clear. respond. It's very clear. They cannot, yeah, they cannot respond. And then the other scholars also will be watching. Yet still, they know Ahl al-Bayt alayhim as are haqq. Ahl al-Bayt alayhim as salam are to be followed if one indeed wants to succeed in this life and the, and the hereafter. Yet they do not do it. So, so the human being, the human being is a strange being. It does not always follow what is right. And a lot of times, rather majority of times, people follow what follow what is in their interest, what they think in their interest, in their worldly short-term interest, rather what is right. So if if, if after uh, Imam Ali alayhi salatu was salam after the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wasallam passed away, why didn't people support the majority didn't support Imam Ali alayhi salatu was salam? Is this Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, You are to me as Moses was as Aaron was to Moses. So when Moses went to the mount, when Israel abandoned Aaron and they followed Samiri, so the same happened. If, you, if one looks into his own life, into his own deeds, everyone, if, if we introspect, we realize when we do something wrong, why we do something wrong. If, for instance, if we don't pray, if we look at a woman with lust, if we tell a lie or if we backbite, we know it's fire of hell. It's not that we don't know. We know for a fact that this causes us to be worthy of the wrath of the Lord. Yet we do it. And people do it all the time. Our sisters do it. Brothers do it. Old men do it. When we commit a sin, and we all commit sins, when we commit sins, so... A uh, common sense would dictate that if we know it's so bad and hell is such a terrible, terrible, horrible, horrible place, we should not do anything that would make us uh, eligible for entering hell. Yet we do it all yep, the we, time. We do, we do it, it all, all the time. time. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. we human beings, we human beings are not always following common sense. We don't always come follow aql. We all, we we do very stupid things, very foolish things. And the, con the conduct of Sahaba after the Nabi wasallam is no different than the conduct of any sinful society in the world. When they do not support the, the, what is right, they do not support what is good, and they do not want to sacrifice, they do not want to stand up for the truth. So it happens, it has happened many times, it often happens in human society. Okay, go ahead, brother. Uh, Sheikh, um, thank you for that beautiful explanation. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I, I was hoping if you could also explain uh, to us about Khalid ibn al-Walid's role in quashing down people who did uh, not pay allegiance to Abu Bakr and how he was sent. Inshallah, inshallah. Uh, that that, to, there's a detail in that. So th there were a lot of people who were Muslims. Who yeah. Who, who, who rejected were Muslims Abu Bakr's and they, caliphate? Yeah, and they did not agree to Abu Bakr being their caliph. And, and they, were, they were Muslims. Yeah, they were Muslims and they defied Abu Bakr's authority. And they said, why should we have to pay taxes, the zakat tax to Abu Bakr? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he was the Nabi. Okay, we were his ummah. As long as we, he was alive, we would pay him the zakat tax. Now, who is Abu Bakr that we should pay zakat tax to? So Abu Bakr crushed these people, rather massacred these people, all these various tribes, which were in amongst tens of them, thousands of people. Who, yeah. Yeah. Amongst, amongst them, was, them, were there any who pledged Imam, uh, allegiance to Imam that, Ali? That was well? a few. That, they were very few. They were very few. Malik ibn yeah. Wayra. These were individuals. Yeah. These were not the masses. So, so the rest, the rest, they were, they were not Shia, but they were just simple Muslims who had just yeah. converted to Islam in the last years of the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and they had not heard any instruction from the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that Abu Bakr is my successor. So they, yeah. and Abu Bakr is now demanding money, is imposing taxes on them. And they've said, why? We are Muslims, but who made you our overlord, our ruler? Mm -hmm. So uh, they were, they were um, alleged by Abu Bakr to be 
to be murtad. And as non-Muslims and non-believers, and their men were killed and their women were raped and taken into bondage and servitude and their children sold as slaves in the streets of Medina. And they were by the thousands. Yeah. So well, wait, but that requires, the, the detail than... requires a speech, inshallah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Because, um... Thank you. May Allah bless you. Allah keep you well, Haider. Thank you very much. Thank, thank, you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Alaykum salam. Oh, sorry. Uh, no. Okay. I have here a caller. I have a caller here from Canada. Canada, go ahead, please. Uh, Just then, Canada, and, uh, yeah, I go ahead, please. Yes. Malik Muslim. Malik Muslim. Yesterday, yeah, I saw your uh, last. Uh, my name is Asnan. Hmm. And yesterday, I saw your manazir, your manazir with uh, the cup cup guy. It was so uh, cool, and you stayed for two more extra hours. Thank you for yeah. that. Allah bless you. And uh, yes. I, re I remember. Yeah, Chandio, Mulana Chandio was also uh, bring the same, I think, the love, and you went through it thoroughly with this guy, and it mm -hmm. caused so many confusion among Sunnis, and uh, a lot of Sunnis are uh, converting, inshallah, back to Shias because of that particular. You stayed back for two hours. Thank you. Allah bless you. And uh, okay, I have, a, I, and I yesterday I saw a clip about you, you recorded six clips uh, for different al Medin. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, one person is very famous in the Deobandi school of thought, and his name is Mulana Manzoor, uh, Mulana Manzoor Mengal. So, if you, um, yeah. uh, if you, if you can uh, also do uh, um, record, recording a one clip for him also, because he's always saying blah, blah about skiyas and all sorts of things. So, yeah. whenever you have time, if you can just Google, Google his name, his name is Mulana Manzoor Mengal. He's very famous among Deobandi. Yeah. He's like Deobandi. And he has recorded the series who, who, of Toronto. Where, do you, where are you calling from? I'm calling from Toronto. Toronto. So you have how many alums you got there? It's uh, it's like right now it's uh, six twenty p.m. Now how many alums? How many scholars do you have? Shia scholars you have in Toronto? Oh, or in Toronto, uh, yeah. there's one Malana Abdi, and mm. that that guy is very like if you are at like hundred, he's like probably at ten percent. So I don't want to so, say he no. don't he don't even. Okay, uh, even, you don't have no. anybody younger than a hundred years old. No, no, I'm just saying. I'm just saying that your um, if you compare the units of the measurement of the knowledge and and then the level of his knowledge is like probably ten percent compared to yours. So he's not gonna come across so, with some guy. So you have you, you ha I um. It's it. I consider this beneath my dignity, really, to record clips for these people. Okay. No, no. Because I'm talking about Malana Mansur. Mal yeah, I'm, Mal I'm talking. About, I'm talking about Mansur too. So it's not. It's not worthy of me that every person calls me and says, "Make a clip for this guy and make a clip for this guy." If you are so, no, okay, um, but... yeah, because I consider that beneath my dignity to address these people in special clips. Ali al Ahsan had been talking about this and pressing me to record clips yeah. for these people for a long time, for a long time. And because he's not a yeah. Shia, he is a non-Shia, and he is asking that, and he is saying that these individuals are the mightiest scholars and mightiest debaters of our denomination. So I agreed to his. Yeah. Otherwise, I suggest, inshallah, tabaraka wa ta'ala, there are many scholars in Toronto. There are dozens of Imam Bargavs in Toronto. There's Akhtar Rizvi is not there. Say Akhtar. Yeah, but you know, but they they, they don't huh? they don't speak they don't have and I don't think they after listening to you I realize that these guys have absolutely huh. no research and no knowledge and they're yeah. just baloney baloney all over. The yeah. <laughs> they don't even yeah. say. So I'm I pretty understand. sorry, but I realize that these guys have just political talk and all 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 nonsense so, and they they can so so to be honest with you. To be honest yeah. with you, so I so thank you for uh, realizing that, but but uh, that's important to understand. That's important to notice. But but to be honest with you, Manzoor and these people, it's okay. Now they know me. All of these guys know me. They have heard about me, and they were challenging so Shias, and they were challenging Shias all the time. And now they are quiet, and now they have disappeared, and they have they crawled back to their holes. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. Even if they do, I do not mention them by name, even if I do not make clips specifically for them, they know themselves, their audience knows it, the Shia knows it, and the Omaris knows, knows it very well. That but, but, these, but scholars, true, if, these scholars are avoiding me. 
These scholars yeah, do not want to them... face me. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. But I, but I, to I make to some... make a clip for every for every um, for every little person there is that I'm not going to do. Okay. Thank you, sir. May Allah bless okay. you. Allah keep okay. you well. Okay. Allah bless you. Thank you. Thank you. And 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 I'm not really fond of you know talking to these individuals. You think I really enjoy talking to these Omari mullah, mullahs? No. I detest. I find it really repulsive to, to talk to these people. <laughs> so, and a lot, and a lot of it is waste of time, waste of effort. Make a clip for this guy. I've made so many clips for these guys. They never come, and even if they come, a debate is not going to occur because what's going to happen? Wasting of time, running away from the topic, and the screaming. And all that shouting match that starts. So I'm not very fond of these things. So, and Omari scholars, they know. The important thing is that you know, they know, the public knows that the Omaris have been, have been um, put into their place. That the Omaris have, <laughs> have been taught many, many good lessons, inshallah, in the past one in two years since I've come to the, into the Urdu speaking uh, scene. Alhamdulillah. Okay. I have a caller from Pakistan. Go Hello, ahead, Pakistan. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. What's your name, bro? Alaikum assalam. Ya Ali Madad. I'm from Karachi. Yeah, yeah. And I'm yes, 19 sir. years old. Okay. First of all, I would like to thank you that your videos have enlightened me. Like I'm, I'm, I'm beginning to be a fan. Actually, I have brought some questions with you according to the topic. I'll try to stick with the topic. Uh, mm -hmm. But first of all, I would like to pray that may Allah Almighty bless you and uh, may I, Malayim Salam, keep you safe. So your topic is about uh, imamat and leadership. Okay, so I, yeah. I'm just I will just ask you two questions regarding this. So I've brought one riwaya which I want to which I want you to look into this and mm. do correct me if this riwaya is authentic or not. Actually, I have been learning Madrasa and Islamic knowledge for two years. So I read this riwayah, I read this hadith when I was in Madrasa. I have, I'm going to read this riwayah in Arabic, so I would like you to translate it in, in English. Okay. So so it's uh, it's the hadith which is quoted by Huzafa Yamani. He says that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Alwailu alwailu li ummati min ashur al kubra wa ashur al sugra. So ila min yatina all ashur al kubra tan aqidu fi baladi baada wafati. Was sugra tan aqidu fi laiba til kubra fi zaura li taga yuresa sunnati wa tabila ahkami. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, I know the translation of the Riwaya al Hadith, and you know that your topic is related to leadership. And mm -hmm. when we hear the word leadership and hear Karachi, Pakistan, there is only one thing that comes into the mind of teenagers that is the leadership of Iran of Khamenei. I'm, yeah. I'm not good to this because uh, I don't believe in Vlad Faki or that kind of stuff. Not yeah. because of watching the videos, but before watching the videos. I, I, yeah. was, I, I didn't believe in that thing. So yeah. uh, actually, the revival which I have put in front of you, so here Rasul said, uh, So yeah. the dictionary, uh, the word Zora is a city. Mm -hmm. And according yeah. to the dictionary, the word Zora is called Tehran. Yeah. Yeah, okay. So Rasulullah said before about the, these both Shuras. The Shura Kubra is which is uh, considered as Saqifa, which we all know. And Shura Sugra. So I want you to like uh, elaborate something like this on this Sirivaya. Okay. Thank you so much. May Allah bless you. Allah keep you well. I'll, I'll talk. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, may Allah bless you. Thank you. So this uh, hadith is in the book of Majma' al Nurain. Lil Marandi. Marandi is for Majma' al Nurain. And this is a Shia book that my Ummah will face destruction in bad days on the account of two Shuras. One shura would be the Saqifa and the other shura would be held in the town of Az Zora. And Az Zora, in narrations, in the hadith, have been applied to Tehran, to Ray, as well as, as, as Baghdad. As Baghdad. So, 
Yeah, this narration exists, and then this narration existed way before the the revolution by Khomeini. So, does the shura um, allude to the Majlis of Khobragan that chose Khomeini as its leader, and then Khamenei its leader? Perhaps, perhaps. I don't know. Allah knows. Okay. Or this is another shura that will come in the future. Allah knows. Because we do not know what future. Future is very vast. We, <laughs> there is, we have lived only 1,444 1, years after the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. No, after the hijrah of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. 1,430 some years after his demise. And what's ahead of us, Allah knows. Right? Future could, could hold many, many other shuras in Tehran, in Baghdad. What we know for a fact if this hadith didn't exist for a fact that Wilayat al faqih is void. Wilayat al faqih does not have any justification. It's just as Abu Bakr's khilaf. Nothing else. Nothing more. Just as void, just as invalid, just as illegitimate as Abu Bakr's khilafah is Wilayat al faqih Even if this hadith did not, because Wilayat al faqih on its own virtue requires, requires proof and there is no proof for it. Proofs not one or two. Many proofs against, stand against the position of Wilayat al faqih So Wilayat al faqih and the revolution of Khomeini, all these things, these are jokes. These are acts of heresy. These are innovations in deen. Okay. May Allah bless you all. I have this caller who is uh, area code 412. Why are you not talking? Go ahead. Salam alaikum. Four one two. Last week. Sorry, who is who, who? Who is it calling? Muhammad. I called last uh, week too. What's your name? I, Muhammad. Muhammad. I called, I like Muhammad calling yeah. from where? The U.S. Where U.S. What city? Uh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania. Okay, may Allah bless you. What can I do for you, Muhammad? Yeah, so I asked you last week about, you know, the folding hands in Salah and then open hands in Salah. Folding and what? I more, the folding hands in Salah, you know, like... Why don't you ca like, call on my landline? Why are you calling on WhatsApp? Call on my landline so I understand you better, okay? All right, is, it the, four, is it the 323 one or is it the... 323. Uh, 323. Right. That's the landline, the U.S. landline, okay? Thank you. All right. Okay, my love bless you. And... Let's go. Let's pick up this call from, where is this call from? Country code 61. Where are you calling from? In my Melbourne, Australia. My name Australia. is Azad. Yeah, Australia. Yeah, mashallah. How are you, how are you doing, brother? Assalamu alaikum. Good, thank you. How are you? Good, alhamdulillah. What's happening? Uh, not much. I've got questions. My uh, first two questions are: uh, Who are the who are the narrator the narrators of Hadith? And my second question is: Are the current mushtaids the ones they call themselves mushtaids? Are they um, narrator of Hadith? If not, why Na not? Narrators of Hadith are scholars who narrate Hadith to you. That's it. Narrate who is a carpenter? A carpenter is a person who makes. Doors, windows, tables, chairs out of out of wood, right? Who's a tailor? A tailor is a yeah. person who prepares dress, sews dress yeah. from from a textile, from from cloth. And who is a narrator of hadith? If a person doesn't narrate hadith to you, he's not narrator of hadith. If he is not writing books of hadith, if he's not writing exegesis of books of hadith, if he's not uh, giving the uh, lectures or drus of hadith then he's not a narrator of hadith if a person is giving mm. fatwa he's mufti he's mufti he's a mujtahid he's a mufti he's not a narrator of hadith yeah yeah so um so the you said narrator the narrator of hadith is someone who can narrate hadith to you can it be not who can no someone... not who can who does not someone who can someone who does that's his his speciality is understanding hadith and uh, explaining hadith and teaching the Shia hadith of Ahlul Bayt. Yeah, that's an array yeah, of hadith. So if, 
if someone comes to me and verbally tell me about some hadith, can he can he become the rector of hadith? No, no. He, it's a scholar. It's a scholar who has vast knowledge of hadith, and he explains hadith, and he narrates hadith, and teaches hadith, and he authors books on hadith. So that's a narrator of yep. hadith. Okay. If if I just quote yep. one hadith, I do. Not, if I just, for instance, saw for you one, one um, handkerchief, or or I make you a glove or something, I do not become a tailor. If I make That's just right, one yeah. wood, well, yeah, one wooden nunchucks, I did not become a, ta a, a carpenter. If I can cook just uh, omelets every day, I cook you an omelet. I did not become a chef. Okay. Yeah. Of hadith, That's right. uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. My other two question is my other two question is, um, hello. Yes. Go ahead. Uh, my other two question is that. Um, in look like, these days, most most Shias can't read uh, hadith themselves, so can't read the uh, hadith themselves because like they might be busy with work or with their life or something mm -hmm. like that. Who should they turn to in terms of gaining yeah. like you so know? So that is that is this is the duty of Shia community to raise scholars who would teach them hadith of Ahlul Bayt alayhim wasalam, because Shias do not have any other choice. There is no other option but to follow the sayings of Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam, the examples of Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam, the statements and actions of Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam. There is no other way to salvation, to bless, to the um, pleasure of Allah. So there is only one path to that, and that is following Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam. And the current scholars obviously do not carry out the duty. They they consider that an athema. They consider that a curse. They consider that. A wrong way to do to narrate hadith to teach hadith to propagate hadith to follow hadith so obviously these scholars do, are not narrators of hadith and they are against hadith they are they are they have digressed they have gone to uh, they have gone astray from the path of ahlul bayt alayhim salam therefore it's on the shia youth to invest time and focus to become Narrators of hadith, and if if one focuses in energy and learns within a few years, two or three years, he becomes very knowledgeable with regard to hadith. And then it's a duty of the Shia community not to support those ulama, those scholars, those marajah who hinder you and who proscribe you from following the sayings of Ahlul Bayt alayhim as salam. And, uh, and support and uh, fund those scholars who would be delivering of hadith, hadith to you that's a necessity there's no other choice than that okay yeah my la last question is uh, when you say sufis yeah what are the difference between the shia beliefs and the sufi beliefs what are the main beliefs how can so we, we differentiate with sufis uh, shia, there are uh, differences are vast we believe in 12 imams rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sufis do not believe in islam sufis believe all religion are correct Every religion is correct. If you're an idol worshiper, that is correct. If you're a Hindu, that's correct. If you're a Christian, that's right. All religions are right. Sufis believe in that. And and recently, one Sufi in Qom, Kamal Haidari, that's what he believes. All religions are good. And many Sufis have professed that. And uh, if you look at the poems of uh, Maulavi, Balkhi, he quite often mentions that. So according to them, everything is right. Uh, yeah, and... Everything is God. If you worship an idol, you worship God because idol is God. God appeared as an, as an idol. God appears in you. God appears in, in me. If I worship this cup, I'm worshiping God. Because God, this is also manifestation of God, of the Lord, of Allah. And uh, so, and they don't follow Ahlul Bayt alayhi wa Ahlul Bayt alayhi wa have, have uh, cursed them and damned them and, and considered them to be outside the bounds of Islam. Okay? So uh, what about uh, thank thank you so much for that. And what about the so-called Shia ulamas or the ones that uh, that say Sufi like you know they have Sufi beliefs? How can we tell? Yeah, yeah. So, so there are a lot of Shia ulama who are just Shia alim just by name. So that that's all uh, I can say. All I can say if if they are Shia, they consider themselves Shia, and Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam have said this, but they follow this. So. <laughs> So I find this all the time, all the time in the books of Shia scholars that Ahlul Bayt have said A and they disagree with Ahlul Bayt. They say no, B is correct. 
So what do I say to these people? And people follow them, people respect them, people revere them. And people consider them to be awliyaullah, these individuals. Allah, I don't, I, I'm, not, I'm not saying wrong. And, and these no, individuals, no. these individuals, yeah, they have, they have on major issues, they abandon the path of Ahlul Bayt, and they either create themselves a path, or they follow the path of another scholar, except the path of Ahlul Bayt, no. So these are just Shia no. by name. Like Khomeini and stuff, yeah? Of course, Khomeini is one of them. Yeah. Uh, how can we tell if someone has uh, some, some scholar or some Shia have these beliefs? How can we differentiate between like normal Shia and uh, Sufi Shia? How do we know? Because they say, oh, we believe in Allah, we believe in Imam, we Shia, like, you know, how can we differentiate between the two? So you be follow the path of Ahl al-Bayt, that's how we differentiate. Okay, thank you, may Allah bless you. Okay, let me take the scholar. How you differentiate? Allah has given you Aql, through Aql. Common sense. Okay, we have a caller from India. India, go ahead, please. Welcome. Yes, Salaamu Alaikum. Uh, Who is my, with me? Uh, uh, myself, Zain Mehdi, from Bihar, India. Uh, and, uh, okay, all, what's happening in Bihar? Bihar? bless you. Uh, Bihar, I have two India. questions. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I am from India, Bihar. It is a very late night. I am just... Uh, <laughs> I want to ask two questions. Uh, um, yeah. I have listened that, uh, hello, uh, I have listened that has Ali al Islam uh, helped every prophet, almost every prophet, uh, prophet Jesus, Moses. Well, Ram, I have not seen prophet. that hadith. Uh, yeah, it's called, uh, but Khutaba say this, okay? Uh, this is commonly, uh, okay, commonly, okay. commonly mentioned. Sufis believe in these things because Sufis, Sufis have a strange belief. So they, 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 the Sufis, they could call Jesus that, they could call um, Omar that, they could call, um, you know, Amir al-Mu'min al that, whatever. But aside from uh, uh, the Sufis, there is no hadith. I have not seen any hadith to that regard that, that Amir al-Mu'min alayhi salatu was salam was helping other other anbiya. I do believe, and I, it's my belief, Amir al-Mu'min alayhi salatu was was created before all prophets. And he, his, his creation precedes them. But whether Allah dispatched Amir al-Mu'min alayhi salam and deputized him to go and help this prophet or this person before the time of our Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam I have not seen I have not seen that evidence Malaika Malaika Amir al Mumin Ali some taught Malaika I've I know, I know I believe in those things those hadith are present but but Amir al Mumin Ali some was with Ibrahim and the and fire and all those stuff I have not seen hadith in that regard okay Okay, uh, I was asking that uh, if uh, Imam Ali Islam is not mentioning Quran, and my second question is that uh, the Hindus of India, uh, the army of Chandra of Maurya, helped Imam Hussein al Islam in Karbala, the Christians, uh, Wahab al Khalbi, uh, martyred uh, in Karbala. But why did uh, the Muslims, all the Sahabas in the, the Sahabas of Makkah and Medina, did not support Imam Hussein al Islam? Uh, all their Muslims. So, so the person, the Muslims. first caller, the first caller asked me a question and I addressed that. His, he said the same thing. So I answered that. Okay. People do wrong things all the time. Okay. Right now, the okay, Shia, the Shia, Shia, now, right now, uh, Shia scholars, why they oppose me? They know I'm right. Right now, Shia scholars, you ask them, why they oppose me? Why? If, if I am wrong, why they don't talk to me? Right? They, no, no. Is there a Shia scholar who can come here and talk to me about Marja'i, about Taqlid, about Inqilab, about Khomeini? No. But the majority of them oppose me. Why they do that? Okay? It's not because, because they are right and I'm wrong. It is because, because people do stupid things all, all the time. People do not want to accept that they are wrong. People do not want to accept that they are in error. Even if it's clear to them they are in error. So that happens all the time. May Allah bless you. Okay? Take care, brother. Okay, my all family members follow Shishani Saab and Khamnai Saab. I am, I, am okay, all, I also follow them. Is all it I can wrong? Say, Is it wrong? <laughs> watch, my, watch my discussions about Taqlid and Wilayatul Faqih, okay? Okay, okay. May Allah bless yeah. you. Can you Allah, for me? Yeah. If you want to go to fire of hell, if you want to go to fire of hell, then follow Sistani <laughs> and Khamenei or follow Omar. It's the same. There, there's no difference between okay. that. May Allah bless you. That is... My okay, answer okay. to you. Yeah, may Allah bless you. Okay, now we have a caller again from the country of Australia. Australia, go ahead, please. 
Assalamu alaikum, Larry. This is Tehwar from Australia. How are you? Good, man. Allah bless you. How are you doing, bro? brother? Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. My, my question was, was regarding the economic system uh, of the Shias, of the world, basically. So when Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he came to the world, uh, he started collecting khums from the people. And in return, he guaranteed them many things, like taking care of their orphans, um, guaranteeing income. Like, for example, if a woman becomes bankrupt, uh, he was supporting them. And we have a hadith in Al-Kafi saying, if a mu'min doesn't have money to go to Hajj, he can ask the Imam. Um, I believe this is in return for the khums that you're paying to the Imam. But I don't see um, anybody who collects khums helping out mu'minin. Like if somebody becomes bankrupt, nobody gives them money to help them out to come out of that. Or if somebody wants to go to Hajj or Ziyara and they don't have money, nobody helps them out. It's just a one-way traffic and it's double taxation for people who are already struggling with their lives. Asking them that it's it's a wajib on you that you got to do it, or else you know nothing is accepted. Uh, your wiladat is not park, your money is not clean. So wh why are people taxing us twice when we we're doing whatever we could in the best way possible, so, giving zakat, we, helping our people? So with regard to khums, I've, I've lectured. You know my lecture. I've told that there's no instruction to give khums to maraje and how you have to convey homes, how do you have to spend homes, I've explained that. So your question is really not, I mean, the whole thing is wrong, right? The whole, if the whole thing is wrong, the whole thing is a fraud, the collecting homes. The whole thing is a fraud. So what can I say? Yeah, so that there's, it's you'll, only you'll just see, one way traffic. You've seen on my Urdu channel, that, on, on my Urdu channel, I, my community, I put a post there about two months ago. That I'm waiting for yeah, yes, someone uh, to bring I, I did to, see. to prove, yeah, to prove us the hadith, show us the hadith that you have to go and give homes to Maraje. Still waiting. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I did see your lectures. Uh, obviously, nobody has the answers. Uh, I can understand nobody can collect it. Like, I mean, uh, it's not a specific reason to collect it. But I was reading Kitab al Hidayah of Sheikh Suduk, uh, where he has a chapter on homes uh, and zakat. What he mentions is homes is on every dinar that you save every year. But the collection of khums and the distribution of the khums is up to the imam. Uh, yeah. And in the Kitab of Zakat, uh, Sheikh Saduk says, uh, because nowadays nobody is collecting khums, that is just after Ghayb al-Kubra, it wasn't being collected. And he says, now that it's not being collected, the Bani Hashim can take zakat because they have been... Um, you know, stop from collecting, you know, getting the homes from the imam. So this seems like historically there is a lot of evidence that for 100 years or so, homes was not being collected. And then suddenly people are getting taxed twice just because they are Shia. Isn't it uh, unfair? Uh, yeah. Yeah, I told you. I've, I've, I've clarified my, it's not a question of fairness. I've, I've, I've clarified the position of Ahlul Bayt alayhim as in this regard. And my speeches with regard to Khums. The whole system is fraud, okay? May Allah bless you. Okay. Allah keep thank you, you so much. Thank you, brother. Thank, thank you. you, thank you. Okay, we have a caller here. What happened to this caller? Salaamu Alaikum. Go ahead, please. Go ahead. I have to speak a few words for you. Oh, I cannot uh, hear you, brother. You are calling from a very bad phone. You have to buy a better phone, okay? Call uh, yeah. a better phone. Yeah, 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 yeah. This phone is terrible. Your phone is terrible, okay? Or maybe your internet yeah. is bad. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And how do you hang up? Let's do th this. Okay. Salaamu Alaikum. Go ahead, please. Yeah. Who's calling, brother? The movie's here from Pakistan. Yes, sir. How are you, sir? Alhamdulillah. I'm really grateful for your time. Uh, actually, I had two questions. Uh, one yeah. was related uh, regarding Muhammad. Uh, mm -hmm. But when I saw your videos and especially your yesterday program, I'm really must. Uh, I'm really grateful for you, and I'm really happy for that. That I'm now really much satisfied uh, regarding Muhammad issues. My only remaining issue is uh, regarding the incident when Umar ibn Khattab entered the house of Hazrat Ali. 
and because I, of I've that, I've answered uh, that question. I've answered that question several times. Okay. Okay, if you yeah, watch just, my just just, want... just do a search on the internet. There are a lot of answers with that regard in, in Urdu, okay? So I, just you, want, yeah. uh, I just want to ask one question, little question, sir. Okay, what's the question? Uh, uh, I saw you one video in which you uh, referred the book of Sulaim bin Kaise Hilali. Yeah. Uh, I read that. Can you refer okay. me any any another book? Uh, so, Except, uh, so there are Bihar al Anwar. Bihar al Anwar is a good, very good book. It has everything you did that you may, might inquire about in great detail. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you so may much. Allah bless sir. you. May Allah keep you all. Thank you. Thank you, brother. Okay. Yeah. UK. Salam alaikum. Go ahead, please. Go ahead, brother. Can you hear me? alaikum. Yeah, I can hear you. Who is it? It's uh, Sayyid Ali from Slough. How can you forget my voice, Sheikh? Oh, because uh, I don't talk to you often, luckily. Yeah, that's possibly, <laughs> that's possibly the reason why. How are you doing? You okay? <laughs> Alhamdulillah. Thank you. What's happening? Yeah, not bad, Sheikh. I just thought I was just okay. brother sent me a link. I thought, let me just check out your, your video and find out how okay. you are. All right, what's happening? So you have like something to say or to ask or to contribute? Yeah, well, actually, I do. Um, yeah, sure. I'll, go, I'll give you a... Yeah, so the first thing is regarding the sacrifices that allegedly Abu Bakr made, that he had a lot of wealth which he accumulated, yeah. Yeah. Uh, which he spent yeah. from the way of Islam. So, no. number one, no. uh, on, on this particular issue, the second is in reference to certain reformist groups, as you're aware, in the UK or the no, certain I'm not aware. Who is the reformist so, group? I think I'll have to uh, send you the details to that shortly, but um, there's an individual who goes by the name of uh, Sayyid Khur Kamanpuri. Uh, I, I don't know. know. He's I'm Shia or he's, uh, he's Omari? He's a. Uh, how can I describe him? He's a. Uh, he's a. He's a. He's a battery. Um, and what does he reform? What is he saying? He's, he's, well, he's claiming that Shiism needs a reform, so he rejects some of the fundamental beliefs, such as mm. the concept of Imama being a uh, divine covenant of God. So they yeah. don't accept. Uh, they have a different interpretation to Gadir, uh, the Hadith of Gadir. Mm -hmm. They they say that it doesn't mean it doesn't establish a direct appointment. Yeah. Um, okay. They reject concepts like Istagatha. So th so that is uh, sort of, although it, although you you might think that that is something very very uh, very out of ordinary, but please remember that these individuals, so it, it's individuals like that, are present also among Shia scholars. In Qom. Absolutely. Yeah, but they but they're just afraid. They do taqiyya. They don't uh, come out in the open, and they don't do not discuss their beliefs. One of those individuals who was such, and he expressed doubt with regard to imama, doubt with regard to infallibility, and these things was Sheikh Asif Mohsini. Sheikh Asif, uh, yeah. he was a grand Ayatollah Sheikh Asif Mohsini, and he was a good friend with Ayatollah Sistani. And at that time, when he when he wrote these things, and he all the time, yeah, from from years ago, he was saying these things. And in his own defense, what he gave once he gave an interview, and he said that I went to see Ayatollah Sistani, and Ayatollah Sistani said that you are doing a great job, you are very brave and bold, and you want to bring reform. I support fully support you, but my position does not allow me to come in the open and express the same views. <laughs> So, but, but because I'm the grand marja, the highest marja, I cannot do this, but you are doing a good job. Inshallah, I support you. And as we all know, the things that you just mentioned, questioning Isma, questioning Ghadir, questioning Ayat Tathir, questioning the ilm of Ayma, the, the Isma of the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, questioning all Ahadith. That was the job 
of Sheikh Asif Mohsini. And I know for a fact Sheikh Asif Mohsini received money from the Wahhabis. Big amount of funds, great amount of money he, did, he received from the Wahhabis. But at any rate... And so when are you going to start and, a series addressing and, some of these uh, and, misconceptions that are spewed by these yeah, uh, extremists? And, and, who, and, who, and did we see any criticism of Sheikh Asif Mohsini by Maraji? No. Sistani, did he criticize him? Did he condemn him? When a person comes and he's a grand ayatollah, Sheikh Asif Mohsini, and he comes and questions Imama, questions Isma, questions Ghadir, questions everything, ilm of Imam alayhi salam, questions Shia hadith. What is, what is Sistani for? What is the grand, you, you, you Shia believe that Sistani, he is the guardian of, of religion. He is the refuge of the Shia. Shia do not have any guardian, any patron, except Sistani in the Asr of Ghaibah, in the time of Ghaibah. Did Sistani or any other merger take any stance against uh, Sheikh Asif Mohsini? No. Until the end, Sheikh Asif Mohsini was not. It was me. I delivered a series of his speeches and I brought his books and criticized his books. But, uh, but only Sheikh, uh, Sheikh Wahid Khurasani issued a brief statement and he did not even mention, it was about, uh, about uh, Mohsini but he did not mention him by name. So if this person is in London is saying these things, so you have to know that, that you don't have to oh, worry no, about- Oh, no, no, he's, uh, he's, he's, he's not from London, but since you men mentioned scholars, there is a, then the issue arises. So which No, my, my point is, my, my point is that, that this person, whether in London, where does he live, this guy? I think he's saying somewhere in India. Um, okay, is, this look, guy uh, in India, I, whoever, I wherever he is, okay, so he, I, I he is of, he is well, anyway, of my I was, I was talking of, about more about a debate challenge on this issue, to be honest with you. He is, a, he is of minor significance. You have to worry about bigger fish. If you're FC Stani so far, he is 90 something years old. Nobody knows his beliefs. Nobody knows Sistani's beliefs on Imama, on Isma. <laughs> <laughs> on the question of ilm of Imam alayhi salatu wasalam. Why does he, why? Why? Why he didn't take any stance? Why Asif Mohsini came and publicly said that the same things that I believe in, Sistani believes in, and Sistani did not re reject those claims. Yeah, well, anyway, so, I, I wasn't and, really part of that and conversation. These sorts so of beliefs, really comment, these sorts on of the beliefs topic of scholars, are constant. Which, yeah, which scholars yeah. do you, which, which scholars do you uh, or respect or did respect uh, on the shoe community because I greatly there, there admire and greatly respect might... greatly respect Allah Majlisi. I greatly admire and respect Mirza Hussein and Nuria Tabarsi. I greatly admire and respect Shaykh Hur Amili. I greatly admire and respect uh, Sayyid Hashim Bahrani. I greatly admire and respect Al Saduq Al Kulaini. All these great scholars of Shia who have defended Shiism. I greatly admire and respect the books on Aqaid by Al Allama Al Hilli, Rahmatullahi Alayhim Ajma'in. Yeah. No, no, it's good. It's good to give this clarity because otherwise people might be of the position that, you know, yeah. you're completely anti-scholar yeah. and I think it's always, always important no, to No, the cur this. current day no. scholars, I, my, my current day scholars, I do not know all of them, obviously. It's impossible to know all of them, especially since for many, many years I'm not in Qom or Najaf, so it's difficult to know their views, their positions. But generally, generally because these, these scholars know me, I do not know them. Most of them know me because they, because I'm, um, in the media and my view my videos and, and the rest are watched all the time so they know me but but uh, the, the uh, current day scholars because i you know the the they a lot of them they are followers of Ulayat, either Ulayat al faqih or marji'iyya or both they are they are on these two categories right there are there are scholars who do not follow either one and there are there are also a big number of scholars they are not a small minority there are a big number of scholars like that so because i I reject both of these uh, categories of Wilayat al faqih as well as Marji'iyya. That's, so that puts me at odds. That puts me in opposition to majority of Shia scholars, obviously. Okay, anything else? Well, Jazakallah, Sheikh. Anyway, inshallah, I'll catch up with you soon. Um, okay. It would be great if you can uh, address this question in reference to um, how Abu Bakr accumulated his alleged wealth and I was oh, I've addressed and that many Palestine. times. If you just in my Urdu lectures, if you do a search in about, English, uh, Abu, I don't think you not in, Eng in not English. English, not in English, in, in Urdu. If you search there, you'll see it. Okay, not in English. 
Okay, may Allah bless you. Anyway, Jazakallah, Sheikh. I, I'm not going to take up any more of your time. I know okay. you're very really busy. Uh, if this guy, uh, if this guy, Hur or whatever his name is, if he wants to talk to me, if he wants to have a, a session with me on, on a specific topic, for instance, rejection of Imama or reject of Hadith al Ghadir. Yeah, we so need to arrange it. We need to arrange it. Yeah, I'll, I'll be, I'll be gl glad to talk to him. Thank you, brother. Take care. Okay, take care. Bye. -bye. Who is with me? Salam alaikum. Salam alaikum, ya Ali Madad. Ya Ali Madad, who is this? I'm talking Ali from Italy. Ali, what's happening, Ali? Good, good. How about you? Alhamdulillah. So, so I have a question about uh, Marjayat. Uh -huh. I don't follow Marjayat. I don't follow Marjayat, but I okay. want to tell my dad. So how can I explain him? Because he will not, uh, he will accept, but uh, I don't know how to encourage him. And the second question is... So you you watch my yeah. lectures on, on Taqlid and you realize, okay, you'll get a lot of, a lot of material, how to talk to people on Marjayat, okay? Okay, okay. And oh, okay, thank you. my second question, and my yeah. second question is, uh, we all know that Aisha is not uh, is is a kafir. So what what was the situation that uh, Rasul Khuda had married him? Okay, so if if person says La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, you can marry him that, that woman. Okay, so Rasulullah sallallahu oh. alaihi wasallam, it was permissible for him to marry Aisha because Aisha used to profess shahadatain. Any person who testifies to Shahadatain, you can marry them. Okay. And it does, not, it is not required to be a good person. You can marry for, for various reasons, a person who is not of good character. Allah said in Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives the example gives the similitude, gives the example of kuffar, of two women, the wife of Nuh, the wife of Noah, and the wife of Lot. So Nuh alayhi salam had married a woman that, uh, that was only Muslim by name. And same way, likewise, uh, Lot. Let me show you this, that verse with English translation, obviously. Surah Al-Tahreem. Surah Al-Tahreem, right? Al-Tahreem. There we go. Okay. There we go. So, God gives advance, God advances examples of Noah's wife and the wife of Lot for those who do not believe. They were married toward two pious devotees, but they were unfaithful to them. And even the apostles could not avail them in the least against God. And it was said to them, enter hell with those who are condemned to enter it, Ahmad Ali's translation. See? So, it is not necessary for the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to always marry the, the best person. It depends. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's situation is such that he needs to uh, gain confidence and gain uh, loyalty of various Arab tribes because after Hazrat Khadija's demise, radiallahu ta'ala anha, Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam moves to Mecca and Muslims are few. Muslims number is very small and all Arab tribes, they abhor Muslims. They oppose Muslims. They hate Muslims. They hate the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And that was a tribal system. And Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam could not fight all Arabs at the same time. And one of the ways to befriend a tribe was to marry into them. So Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam married into Jews, married into Bani Umayyah, and married also into Quraysh. So 
Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam married. So it's not always a person marries a woman because he wants to spend the rest of his lives with her, life with her. A person does not marry a woman because he wants, necessarily because he wants to have children from her. You could marry a woman because it suits your, for visa reasons, for instance, or for you, for, for you, it's better for your business. It will give you a business advantage or it's, it's, it's uh, beneficial to your career. So marriage is not always, not always for the purpose of forming a family, bearing children. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was facing a very urgent, very extremely uh, uh, dire situation that they were facing existential threats. Their very lives were in jeopardy. The Muslim nascent, uh, newborn Muslim community in Medina, they were subject to being exterminated by Arab tribes. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had to gain friendship and loyalty of the many tribes around Medina and in the Arab world. So he marries into different 10 marriages. When he was young, when he was young, he married only one woman, right? When he's old, but now because he's leading a community and there's a tribal system, so he marries women. A lot of these women are old. A lot of these women are, have children. They are, they are uh, widows. But the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam marries them. So that's the wisdom of the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And that is, uh, that is uh, the Sharia of Allah. You can marry a woman if she professes Shahadatain, even if she does not believe in Shahadatain. If as so long as she says, I'm Muslim, you do not have to open her heart and examine really in her heart what she believes in. Anybody who says, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he's a Muslim. And then if later on she this person does things that contravenes Islam, then that indicates that she is a munafiq. She is a munafiq. A munafiq is a person who expresses Islam, who testifies to Islam, but inside his kafir, and he hides his kafir. Such a person is subject to Islamic law. Such a person is not treated as a kafir, right? So, Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam treated all munafiqeen as Muslims. He even prayed for them when, he, when they died. He would go to their funerals. He would bury them. He would pray for them. They, he treated the munafiqeen as, by prayers, I mean they, he performed funeral prayers for them. Salatul Jinas. Okay. We have a caller here. Salaamu Alaikum. Uh, Toronto, I think. Toronto, 905. Go ahead. Yes. Salaamu Alaikum. What's your name, brother? Wa Alaikum. My name is Ahmed. Ahmed, what's happening? Nothing, brother. I want to ask you, uh, mm. that the good, one thing you're doing good job that going against this, uh, uh, Khayasi, Mujtahideen and, uh, all this, I really appreciate that you're doing very good okay. job. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Yes. Because I even send the LAN on this, uh, Khayasi, Mujtahideen and, uh, uh and Omar Bakar Osman LAN at Beishimar as well. Okay. So, uh, brother, the question is, uh, I want to ask you, that uh, Wilayat Amir al Mu'minin alayhi salatu waslam, what we uh, understood according to Aima alayhi salatu waslam's akhwal, that we have to give this uh, gawahi in tashahud as well. Because uh, there is a hadith of Itijaj Tabrisi, Imam Sadiq alayhi salatu waslam have told that uh, uh, whenever you say La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, you have to say uh, foreign kahdo aliyun waliullah. So, is bunyat par ham jo so ab namaz mein to hama ko koi khatloam nahi karne wala azam mein agar denge to taqiyatan sabaz halaton mein jo so aapko khamush rehna hai ki bhai azam denge to sab ko pata chal gaya bhai this uh, english show english english okay Okay, okay, brother. Okay, the, right. Sorry, the thing is uh, uh, because when you are reading uh, in salat, yeah, yeah, you understood my question. Yeah, I understood the question. Thank you, may Allah bless you. Okay, I'll answer your question. Okay, with regard to tashahud, huh. mentioning the name of Amirul Mu'minin alayhi salam. So the uh, this um, let me pull the hadith for you.
So it's not obligatory to say the name of Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam in tashahud. It's not required. If you just say La ilaha illallah Muhammad al-Rasulullah, that is suffice. That is sufficient. Uh, consider this, Al-Furu' min al-Kafi lil Kulayni rahmatullahi alayhi. This is volume number three. Okay, so here you go. At-Tashahud fi al-Rak'atayn al-Awwalatayn wa al-Rabi'ah wa al-Taslim. Tashahud in the Tashahud in the second rak'at and the fourth rak'at. Okay. Um, I asked Al-Imam I asked um, Al Imam Muhammad al Baqir alayhi salam an adna ma yujzi min at tashahud the least amount, the least amount, the most concise amount of words that is sufficient and tashahud, the minimum that, that will, that will, that will um, be enough for tashahud is what? A shahadatan. The shahadatan is sufficient. If you say shahadatan, that's sufficient. So, when Imam alayhi salam says that, then you cannot come, right? You do not know tashahud better than Imam Baqir ulum al nabiyin alayhi salam, Muhammad ibn Ali ibn al Hussein salawatullahi alayhi majma'in. You do not know better than them. So, so if I say, Ashadu an la ilaha illallah, Ashadu anna Muhammad an abduhu wa rasooluh, this is tashahud. This is enough. So if I don't say Ashadu Anna Ali and Waliullah, Ashadu Anna Fatima Al Zahra Sayyidat Al Nisa Al Alameen, Ashadu Anna Al Hassan Al Hussein, Imam Al Huda. I've done Tashahud. If I don't say, I don't have to say it. That's enough. However, however, it's not, it's not uh, um, prohibited to say more. If you want to say more, say more. Uh, look at this Hadith, the same chapter. أي شيء أقول في التشهد والقنوت. What ذكر should I say in تشهد إن القنوت؟ قال بأحسن ما علمت. فإنه لو كان مؤقتا لأهلك الناس. He said that it is there is no specific thing that you have to say in تشهد. The best that you know, the best that you know. So this permission from the Holy Imam عليه السلام, الإمام محمد باقر علوم النبي عليه السلام. Permission from him. And this is permission from Allah, obviously. That you could uh, recite any dhikr, any remembrance, the, or the best that you have, as so long as you can say it's a testimony, because it's tashahud, right? It's testimony. So so then you can, you, you that that's permissible in tashahud. So you ashadun la ilaha illallah, ashadun Muhammad Rasulullah, ashadun Ali and Waliullah, ashadun Fatima al Zahra, Sayyidu Tinsal Alami. أشهد أن الحسن والحسين سيدي شباب أهل الجنة وإمامي الهدى وأشهد أن علي بن الحسين إمامي وأشهد أن محمد بن علي إمامي وأشهد أن جعفر بن محمد إمامي وأشهد أن موسى بن جعفر إمامي وأشهد أن علي بن موسى إمامي وأشهد أن محمد بن علي إمامي وأشهد أن علي بن محمد إمامي وأشهد أن الحسن بن علي إمامي وأشهد أن الإمام الحجة المنتظر المهدي إمامي وأشهد أن هؤلاء حجج الله وخلفاء الله وأوسياء رسول الله بهم أتولى ومن عدائهم أتبرع إلى الله all of this so you can say all the 12 imams عليهم السلام 14 معصومين عليهم السلام give شهادة to them however if you just say شهادتين that's enough that's enough so but, but remember one thing that um, it's not that أمير المؤمنين عليه الصلاة والسلام إمامة uh, but if you if you insert an the Imam of Amir al Mu'minin alayhi salam in your namaz, and you don't believe in the Imam of Imam Hassan, Imam Hussein alayhi salam, your namaz will do any good to you. No. If a person uh, doubts the Imam of any Imams alayhi salam, it's as if he doubts Allah Ta'ala. Okay? All right, here we go. Salaamu Alaikum, who is the caller? Who is the caller? UK. Wa alaikum salam. Yes, brother. Who is it? Yes. My name is Junaid. Junaid, what's happening? Yeah. So I have uh, maybe two quick questions. Um, yeah. You were speaking about the uh, the marja. So I wanted to know if 
Well, of course, we have to go straight to the hadith of the Ahl al-Bayt. No, no, oh. I do not say that you have to go straight to hadith. I do not say that. Oh, okay. I say so that, how would you go it's, about the, that? It's, the, it's the duty of scholars to deliver the hadith of Ahl al-Bayt to the public. Because we know okay. for a fact, we know for a fact that people cannot go to hadith straight. That would be absurd. Somebody is in the UK, doesn't speak Arabic, he barely speaks English, or he works 50 hours a week. How is he going to go read hadith and learn hadith? No. Right. It's the duty of the scholars. What are scholars for? What, are, what do you support them for? Where does your homes go? I'm never saying, look, my opponents attribute to me absurd things because if they present my positions as I enunciate, then nobody could reject my positions. You can doubt my positions. You could ridicule my positions only if you distort them and pre present them in a distorted way, which I did not mean. In other words, which if, you've, uh, if you attribute lies to me, then yes, you, those lies are lies. Then you can, you can ridicule them and reject them. But I never say that Shia common people has to go to hadith. I'm saying everybody has to follow hadith but everybody cannot read hadith, and it's the duty of scholars. And instead of learning fatwa, they should devote their ears to learn hadith, and it's their duty, instead of delivering fatwa to the common people, deliver the fatwa of Ahl al-Bayt, which is their hadith. They have to deliver hadith to, to the Shia, and if ulama, just as I in this session, about, about uh, tashahud, now somebody asked, I presented a hadith. If scholars everywhere, they delivered a hadith of Ahlul Bayt alayhim salatu wassalam, then you would not find it so difficult to find, uh, follow hadith. It is because scholars are a hindrance. Scholars are a wall between you and Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam. They prevent you from following Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam. That's why you think following hadith is so difficult. Go ahead, please. Okay. So I apologize for that. So, yeah. oh, uh, so I'd say, um, so, because I'm quite new to being a Shia, so I'd say, are there any or specific scholars in the UK that you would say are a good representation of, the, of scholars that I could be following? Yeah. So, I do not know the scholars in the UK, but the vast majority of Shia scholars, they do not know Hadith. Even the Maraji, they do not know Hadith. The Mujtahideen, they do not know Hadith. They don't read Hadith. They do not teach Hadith. They do not encourage their students to learn Hadith. And they never analyze hadith, and they do not go into details in understanding a hadith. So indeed, it's a very, very uh, dire situation in the Shia community. And it's a very, very pitiful and embarrassing situation in the Shia community that, that, um, that no, that even if you ask me in Iraq, in Iran, is there anyone I could refer you to? I would say, no, I don't know them. Uh, that, and partly that's because I don't know the scholars. If there might be scholars in the UK and the Shia community who know hadith, if you went to them, they could answer you with hadith, but, but I do not know them because, um, because I'm not in contact with these scholars and these scholars for various reasons, they do not stay in touch with me. Yeah, go ahead, please. Yeah, yeah. So would you say it's very important for me to understand, you know, uh, I think the hadith science of knowing how to... Uh, Mm -hmm. Maybe grade a hadith or understand why a hadith is sahih or da'if and how to follow it or why I should or shouldn't be following it. What is the question? Come again, please. Would you say that it's important for me to understand how to know the grading of hadith, you know, like how to understand if a hadith is da'if? Yeah, it's sahih. important. Yeah, it's important. At least, at least for every Shia, that much that you need. That amount yeah. of hadith that you need if, in order to perform your daily activities and daily rituals, the, that minimum yeah. is required. And you do not know, have to know that in Arabic, as long as the translation is valid, because right. um, what is, what, you have to follow Ahlul Bayt alayhim as -salam. So as long as yeah. the translation so, is valid, uh, solid and valid, that suffices. But uh, there is no doubt that a minimum amount of knowledge of, of uh, of the teachings of Ahlul Bayt alayhim as -salam, that there is no escape from that. That yeah. is absolutely and compulsory. Yeah. And are there any English books that do this very well that I could search well, up or read? So, so I'm not really a good person to ask about English books because yeah. I do not read English books except when I read some literature <laughs> or I, when yeah. I read news or something. 
then I read English. Yeah. And I don't read a lot of literature either. So, but sometimes I try okay. to learn, uh, read uh, some something for my kids or something. But I don't read generally yeah. English books. But if you ask the, bro the brothers, there are in uh, different chat groups or forums. There are some forums who people who listen to my lectures. They have some some uh, WhatsApp groups. If you go, th I don't supervise these uh, WhatsApp groups. If you go there, there are some people who could guide you. I think there are okay. there are a lot of translations of hadith into English. But which translations yeah. are better than the rest? So that I really I cannot guide you. Sorry. Okay, no problem. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. May Allah bless you. Allah keep you all. Thank you, brother. Okay, guys. Oh, let's see. We have a caller here from which country? Australia. Well, Australians right, are waking right. up, huh? It's it's like early in the morning there. Salamun alaikum. Who is with me? Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. I'm calling from Melbourne, Australia, and I had a couple yeah. of questions, inshallah, for me. Allah bless you. Allah keep you all. What's up happening? Go ahead. Um, my first question is regarding um, some of the Sahaba. So during the time Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam was alive, right? Did he know that yeah. these certain Sahaba, such as Abu Bakr, Umar, and Uthman, were going to turn against him when he died? And if he, if he did know that, did, um, mm -hmm. why didn't he take any action against them while he was alive? Like, why didn't okay. he do anything about it? Yes, so, and my second so, question is, yeah, yeah. My second question is, when when we were speaking with some of these Umaris, they they like to make the argument that if Abu Bakr and Umar are such bad people, why is he buried? Why are they buried next to such a blessed and good man? Well, what should be our response to this? What should we say to the Sheikh? Okay, I'll answer both. Thank you. May Allah bless you. May Allah bless you, Sheikh. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, the first question: If the Nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam knew, uh that Abu Bakr and Umar were, were turning, later on turn against him and they were going to murder the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and usurp Imama. Why did he didn't? Uh, he, did, he should have killed him, right? <laughs> he should have just prevent all these crimes from happening. <laughs> or he should have done something. So the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did plenty, did plenty. Um, as far as the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam uh, actually punishing them for future crimes, that would be uh, not allowable. That would not be permissible. That is not permissible in the Sharia of Allah, in the laws of Allah Ta'ala. So if, Nabi if Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala knows a person is committing, for instance, zina tomorrow, and he informs the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, this person tomorrow or day after tomorrow, in one week, he'll commit zina. So the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam should take it now, punish him, or castrate him, <laughs> right? <laughs> Make it impossible for him to commit zina. <laughs> castrate him. <laughs> or put him in a, in a prison, do something like that. That's not permissible. So nobody is subject to punishment for a crime until he commits the crime. Until he commits the crime. The Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam could warn, he could give a sermon that, that zina, committing zina ha, uh, uh, ensues these, um, these consequences. But he, the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam cannot, of course, cannot punish him. If the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, for instance, in the life of Abu Bakr and Omar, he had brought upon a punishment upon Abu Bakr and Omar that would have made it impossible for Abu Bakr and Omar to do what he, they have done after the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, today, how we would have looked at, at, at history, right? If Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had brought upon a punishment on, on Abu Bakr and Umar, in a way that it would have prevented Abu Bakr and Umar from carrying out their crimes that they, they, they carried out, now we will look back, the world will look back, Non-Muslims would look at the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They would look at Abu Bakr and Umar would see innocent people. Because Abu Bakr and Umar, in this version of history, have not done anything. Because Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did something to them. Because, so, and, they, and they were never able to carry out their crimes. So in this version of history, Abu Bakr and Umar are innocent. But they were punished. So people will see the harsh, uh, uh, behavior of the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam with respect to Abu Bakr and Omar, people who are innocent of anything. So who would be criticized? 
before history, before people, before before any fair conscience, the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, people who would accept that all oh, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam knew that they were going to be very terrible people, therefore he killed them, killed innocent people. The world would see it as a very, uh, would have, uh, as a crime, not as a service. So th that's not permissible in Islam anyways. So the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did not kill Abu Bakr and Omar, but the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did plenty to forewarn his ummah about Abu Bakr and Umar. In Shia books of literature and hadith, there are many, many warnings from the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam plenty of the time uh, addressed Abu Bakr and Umar specifically and said that after my demise, you make sure you follow my brother-in-law and my son and my brother Amir al-Mu'minin alayhi salam. You make sure you do not have any greed for Khilafah. And they may, repetitively, Abu Bakr and Omar, they profess their loyalty and their allegiance to following Amir al-Mu'minin alayhi salam. And the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and many other ahadith, they addressed, he addressed Abu Bakr and Omar and he said, I know what you're going to do and you're lying and you would be violating these pacts that you have made. So individually, he uh, warned Abu Bakr and Omar. And also he warned his Sahaba and Shia Hadith and warned Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam that these are individuals, Quraysh in general, Arabs in general, and these specific Sahaba. They, after me, they will, they will um, take over Imama and Khilafah, and they would uh, murder my daughter, and they will bring upon Islam the tragedies, the innovations, the, the uh, misguidance, unimaginable. So Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam many a time said that, right? And in my next lecture, these warnings of the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would be presented to you more clearly from Umari books, not just from Shia books, from Umari books. So that's another step, step the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam took. And, and Umari, even in Umari books, this matter, the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam warned his ummah about Abu Bakr and Umar's khilafah, that these individuals are very, very evil people, that they will, uh, be, uh, um, they will be bringing uh, mischief upon Islam, are tremendous. And inshallah, in my next lecture will be on this topic because we are talking about Imam, how the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam perceive and visualize the time ahead of him after his demise, the time after his demise. So, Inshallah, that will be discussed there. And then the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam also, uh, during his time, he did uh, recite to Muslims verses of the Noble Quran, which were revealed in condemnation of Abi Bakr and Umar. And these verses of Noble Quran are present in Bukhari and Muslim. Bukhari and Muslim concurred that these verses of the Noble Quran, for instance, in Surah Hujurat and many other Surah Ali Imran, Many other verses that have been revealed in condemnation of Abu Bakr and Omar specifically for their misdeeds. And these, and these uh, condemnations are not simple. They are condemnations of kufr, of nifaq, of eternity and fire of hell. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not left any excuse for anybody. If the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says amongst the Muslims, he recites his, these verses from a sermon, from his pulpit on, in a sermon, and he recites these verses in these surahs, in his salah, in his prayers, and he commands his ummah that you have to recite these verses in, 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 in these surahs. And these verses, these surahs have been revealed in condemnation of Aisha, condemnation of Hafsa, condemnation of Abi Bakr, Omar, Uthman. Not one or two, many, 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 many. So do you think there would remain any, any stone unturned that the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has, hasn't presented to Muslims enough proofs and hujjah and warning about Abu Bakr and Omar? So if you, I don't know, in English perhaps I've not these, delivered these lectures about the verse of Quran in condemnation of Abu Bakr and Omar that are with Sahih, Shan al, Shan al Nuzul, and Omari books of Hadith. But inshallah, if I continue these lectures, you will find plenty of material in this regard. 
And then another action the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam took about Abu Bakr and Umar was that he always treated them with great amount of uh, disrespect and insignificance. He never appointed Abu Bakr and Umar an army to any, to any uh, as leaders to any army. He never appointed them as his emissaries. He never gave them an important job, Abu Bakr. They were insignificant during the time of the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Abu Bakr and Omar. They didn't play any crucial role in anything. There were many, many armies dispatched to different battles, to different tribes. There were emissaries sent to the courts of uh, distant kings, which were important, obviously important missions. Never Abu Bakr and Omar. Yes, one time, one time, when Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salatu was salam, ill in his eyes, and he could not see properly in the Battle of Khaybar, the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam gave command to Abu Bakr and Abu Bakr embarrassed the Muslims by running away from Khaybar. And the next day he gave it to Omar by Sahih Ahadith in many books. Omar also ran away from the battle with that, and he embarrassed the Muslims and Muslims testified to the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that this person is very, very weak and very, very coward. So obviously the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam knew Abu Bakr and Umar and that they, they are incapable of leading Muslims. So why does he embarrass them this way? If, for instance, if, if I know this person cannot fight, right? That's very obvious. I know this person cannot fight. He's not a man of battle. He's not a man of sword, right? I put him into a cage. Huh. This person is not trained in MMA, for instance. I put him in a cage with an MMA fighter. What's going to happen to him? So, of, of course, of course, I've embarrassed this person. I've disgraced this person. I've caused, I have caused this person's misery. So, when the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam sends Abu Bakr, we all know history. Abu Bakr is not a man of sword. Abu Bakr is not a military leader. Abu Bakr has never fought in any battle. He has not thrown a stone against the mushriks. He sends them to fight the mighty, uh, battle-hardened uh, Jewish uh, uh, heroes of battles, Marhab, in Khaybar. <laughs> so why does he do this? It would be equivalent if I send, a, send an old man against uh, Tyson Fury <laughs> in the ring, right? <laughs> if Tyson Fury came and challenged Muslims for a fight, I send an old man who doesn't know any boxing. He doesn't have any boxing his skills. I send him, send him out. So what have I done? Of course, of course, I knowingly have put this person in a position where he would be ridiculed. He would be laughed at. He would, he would, he would, I would I've destroyed his reputation. Then that's exactly. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was wise. He knew what he was doing. He was not a simple person that he doesn't know Abu Bakr cannot fight. He exactly knows what he's doing. He, there, there is only one explanation. The Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam sends Abu Bakr and then Omar, right? And he knows, Allah knows, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam knows that these people have never fought and they have no reason to fight Kuffar. Abu Bakr and Omar didn't have any motivation to fight non-Muslims because they had no loyalty, no allegiance to Islam or Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam ever. If they had, they had any motivation to fight Kuffar, you would have seen in these, in these, various battles and conflicts that occurred during the lifetime of the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they have taken some uh, military uh, adventures, undertaken some military uh, adventure. They have never done that. So Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam sends them and he, as expected, they run away. They run away. So why? <laughs> the question is why? So the question is, obviously, it's, it is to put them in a position where would they would be historically, historically disgraced? They put Abu Bakr and Omar, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, through his infinite wisdom, put him in a position in this military conflict about, against the battle hardened heroes of Khaybar, warriors of the Jews who were very brave, very, very intelligent, very valorous uh, swordsmen. Put them into <laughs> opposite to them, and they run away. They embarrass Muslims. They embarrass Islam. But what is achieved? 
is so beneficial for Muslims, for the posterity, for eternity, that these person's leadership is destroyed forever. Forever. You know what happened before Bayt Battle of Khaybar? Bayat al-Ridwan. 20 days before Bayt of Khaybar was Bayat al-Ridwan. لَقَدْ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ عَنِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ إِذْ يُبَايَعُونَكَ تَحْتَ الشَّجَرَ So history is clear. 20 days before this, their escape, their flight from Khaybar, they, under the tree, they had Abu Bakr and Umar. They had pledged allegiance with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that we will never run away. We will die in battle and never run away. That was the Pledge of Allegiance in Bayat al-Ridwan. So, the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam takes, first takes their pledge. <laughs> that they will never run away. And then, sends them to this mission that he knows very well that they will run away. And they run away. What is, what is the lesson? Because the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sends a message to you and me. For the eternity, for the posterity, for the future generations to come. That Abu Bakr and Omar, no, they were insignificant. In the time of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they were totally destroyed. They embarrassed, not only embarrassed, but humiliated. A disgrace, nothing, nothing. They were nothing, they were zero. Who, who made them zero? Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam made them zero. Who destroyed their reputation? Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Without punishing them for taking over Khilafah, the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam punished them for taking over Khilafah in this way. Okay. So that's the answer. And many, there are many other instances, inshallah, in the future I'll talk about how the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam time and again embarrassed, but rather humiliated Abu Bakr and Omar. For instance, his dispatch of Abu Bakr for the recitation of Surah Al-Bara'ah. And then, once he departs, then humiliates him and fires him. And he says, only a person that is from me, only a person who is from me, he can deliver this message. And Abu Bakr says, has there been a verse revealed about me in my condemnation? Because he feels the humility. He feels the embarrassment. He feels, feels the disgrace. At any rate, so that, that is the answer to that question. Second question, Abu Bakr and Omar are buried next to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Burial next to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would be an honor. Would be an honor. An infinite honor. If it was with the permission of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. If it's without the permission of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, then it is a, an act of uh, usurpation, an act of stealing. Okay? So, Abu Bakr and Omar are buried on the property of the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This is not a public bur burial place. This is Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's personal, personal property, his house. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam never, ever, he instructed that Abu Bakr and Omar be buried next to him. If it was with the will of the Nabi, with the will of Allah, directions from Allah, Abu Bakr and Umar be buried there. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, so yes, then it would be a clear proof for the Umaris against the Shia. The Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam loves these two individuals. Then it would become incumbent upon us, Shia, to love Abu Bakr and Umar. But we all know that there is no permission from the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam they stole everything. They even stole the house of the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Is it permissible for me to bury a body at your house? You tell me. <laughs> I bring. I want to bury these people in your house without your permission. Is it permissible? No, of course not. Of course not. So this is the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is buried in his own personal property. The rooms were all, the rooms of all of his wives and the room that he lived in, they were all his own property. And he was buried there. And his property after his demise would be transferred to his only heir. And that's Fatima of Zahra, sallallahu Because wives do not get anything from the, any, any heirloom that is, that is uh, property. Wives get from clothes, from money, they, they get one eighth. But from, from, from the actual land, property, and houses, wives do not get anything. Even if they got anything, they will get one eighth. So one eighth is what? 
One eighth is 12.5%. 12.5% is divided in, uh, uh, amongst nine wives. So each wife gets about one in one, barely one and a half percent. The rest all goes to Fatima the Zahra. That's the rule of Islam. Okay. So if the Nabi Sallallahu house was transferred as an inheritance, it would be Zahra's, Zahra's uh, property. And they never, Abu Bakr and Umar never asked Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam for permission or Zahra Sallallahu Alaihi for permission or Zahra's children, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, ajma'in, for permission to be buried there. If it is inheritance, as we believe, as Quran says, as that's the Sharia of Islam. As if we say that it's Sadaqah, it's Sadaqah, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's property becomes Sadaqah, then Sadaqah means it's for the poor. It's all poor people's property. Not Abu Bakr and Umar's property. It still, it'd be an usurpation, right? If there's, a, if, if there's a land, it belongs to everyone. I cannot usurp there without permission from everybody. So therefore, Abu Bakr and Umar's burial next to the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is not something that Umaris could be proud of. It's another instance of Abu Bakr and Umar stealing and Abu Bakr and Umar violating the laws of Islam and, and taking over things and taking over positions that they are not theirs. And in Shia hadith, we have um, hadith that Abu Bakr and Umar are not there. Angels of wrath had transferred them immediately to valleys of hell. Okay? Salaamun Alaikum. Go ahead, please. Salaamun okay. Alaikum. Yeah, bro. Yes, brother. Who is with me? Uh, this is Mukhtar from Manchester. Yeah, Mukhtar from Manchester. How are you doing, brother? Alhamdulillah. Thank you very much for your time, for giving this lecture, especially after the long session that you had yesterday with the Urdu speaking channel. I hope that Allah you're not you. very tired. Allah bless you mm -hmm. and your family. Um, Thank you, sir. I want to say one thing because a brother called and talked about uh, Sheikh Mohseni and you mentioned Mohseni. Mm -hmm. For people who don't know, this person is probably one of the worst people uh, who adorned himself and called himself a sheikh and an ayatullah in the, in the Shia community. You've already mentioned some of the stuff, but one thing that people forget about is during the civil war in Afghanistan, he was the leader of this party called Hizb Harakat. And the number of people, I don't want to get into politics because a lot of people are sensitive about this, but number of people that he was involved in killing or betraying and murdering is beyond, is in thousands. And we're not talking about the people who are from Mukhalifin, we're talking about the Shia people who were killed by his orders because of uh, his political hunger. And also, um, he also doesn't believe in Ahadith and the authenticity, authenticity of the Ahadith. He says that, I think he has a book that he summarized, Bahal Anwar, 110 volume book into two volumes, which shows a lot of disrespect to all the ulama who've spent uh, centuries, you know, gathering all the hadith and he just comes and says all of them are rubbish you know this, this just shows his character and it shows his son's character that he just comes in his support and um, when he died um, a few years ago he wrote, he wrote a mm -hmm. statement saying that you know this is a big tragedy for Islam and he um, gave his uh, uh, condolences to his family so that's that's about that I had a couple of questions if, yes, if brother. you do if have time so the first question I had was uh, was about um, the word imamat. So obviously, one of the one of the things that some Shias do is that they they give the title of imam to certain people, and we know who those people mm -hmm. are. Mm -hmm. uh, and the reason they use for using this word is that oh, in Islam we have this thing called we say imam jamaat. You know, we can use mm -hmm. the word imam for jamaat. So um, so that so therefore it is okay to use this word for someone who is non masum. Therefore, we can use it mm -hmm. for you know. Certain people, Khomeini, Khui, yeah. Musa, Sad, etc., etc. Yeah. So, can you, uh, if you, if if you don't mind, can you explain to me uh, if it's okay for us? Is there, is there, is it mentioned in a hadith um, the use of the word Imam for Bayd Masum, especially yeah. Imam Jamaat, or not? Yeah. Thank you so much. May Allah bless you. Uh, okay. The the word for Imam Jamaat, yeah, of course, that's that's common in a hadith. That's plenty. But to somebody call somebody as imam, and uh, other in the context of congregational prayers, 
I do not, uh, there are a hadith that could be interpreted as prohibitive in this regard. Okay? So, the usage of word imam with respect to the imam of congregational prayers, that's, that's plenty. That's, uh, there are many instances of that in hadith. But, the usage of word, the use of word imam in the context outside congregational prayers for somebody other than a true imam, ma'asum imam. In this regard, there are a hadith that could indicate prohibition. Let me... show you if, um, those hadith. If I could find those hadith. So, this is Al Usul Min Al Kafi Lil Kulaini, Rahmatullahi Alayhi, volume number one, published by Darul Kutub Al Islamiyah, here at page 372, uh, hadith number one. Qala Qultuhu Lahu, Qawlullahi Azza wa Jal. I said, What is the interpretation of these verse of the Noble Quran? The verse is. Surah Zumar, verse number 61. Okay. وَيَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ تَرَى الَّذِينَ كَذِبُوا عَلَى اللَّهِ وُجُوهُمْ مُسْوَدَّةِ And you will see on the day of judgment people who falsified uh, false statements and attributed them to Allah. People who made a false statements and attributed to, to Allah that their faces are burnt off black. Their face, faces are like charcoal. Okay. Qala man qal inni imamun wa laysa bi imam. This is with regard to those people who says I am an imam and he's not an imam. Okay. Qultu wa in kana alaviyan. I said even if this person is from the children of Ali alayhi salam. Qala wa in kana alaviyan. قلت وإن كان من أول علي بن أبي طالب even he was a descendant of علي بن أبي طالب عليه السلام he says he said وإن كان even if he is a descendant of علي عليه السلام okay So if after that, let's look at the second hadith in this chapter. من ادعى الإمامة وليس من أهلها فهو الكافر Whoever claims إمامة and he isn't, he doesn't deserve it. He doesn't, he is, he is kafir. He's kafir. So when you call a person Imam, so you don't really claim Imamat for them, but you claim a sort of Imamat for them. So you don't find anybody in the world who has claimed imama, who has said, I'm appointed by Aima alayhi salam. Very few like that, right? Most people who claimed imama and they were kafir, they said we are imam. Like uh, Abu Bakr, Omar, and these people, or Abu Hanifa, these people. But they never claimed that they are appointed by, by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They said we are imam. Wow. Whichever way they became imam for, uh, how, uh, we became imam. So look at this hadith. Man ashraka ma imam in imamatu min indillah, man laysat imamatu min Allah kana mushrikan billah. Bali. Thalatatun la yukallimuhum Allah yawm al-qiyamah wa la yuzakihim wa lahum adabun alim man idda'a imamatan laysat 
من الله ليس لا ومن جحد إماما من الله ومن زعم أن لهما في الإسلام نصيبا To this effect there are many many ahadith So it's not a good idea to call someone out, someone imam. And it was not prevalent in the Shia to call their scholars imam, right? Historically, if we go throughout history, there have been many great scholars, Allama Majlisi, um, Allama Hilli. These people were very great scholars, especially Majlisi, Muhammad Taqi Majlisi, these people. But they, Shias, didn't, they, neither they themselves called themselves imam, nor uh, the Shia, other scholars called them imam. They always avoided that. However, in the Umaris, always they call their scholars imam. Okay, Salaamu Alaikum. Go ahead, please. Uh, hi, Walaikum Salaam, Ya Ali Madad. Walaikum Salaam, Ya Ali Madad, Ya Ali Madad. Go ahead, who is it? Who is uh, I called you before. Uh, this is uh, Sayyid Asir Ali Zadi from Houston, Texas. Yes, Sayyid Asir Ali Zadi. What's happening? Yes, uh, Sheikh, I just uh, first I wanted to say you that uh, I want to tell you that uh, um, these um, the 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 things that you are telling us and uh, mm -hmm. uh, and on the top of that uh, the way you are uh, apart from the things that you you uh, defend or uh, answer to the questions of Umris in your Urdu sessions and also in your English uh, sessions, uh, you have uh, that presence of mind that you don't uh, fall for their diabolical ways to trick you because mm -hmm. they, they come on your session to uh, to a project or to tell you that they, they are very sincere or they are they are something they, they want uh, from you. But yeah. uh, on, the, on the other side, they... Uh, uh, you also know, and you were mentioning in your yesterday's session that uh, now they are uh, accumulating your answers just to uh, just to uh, know that where your weakness lies, and uh, they they are just trying to strike, uh, or they are just finding uh, some uh, like uh, weakness of yours uh, to strike at that point. Uh, okay. I think uh, you also agree with me. Okay. Inshallah. Yeah, so, okay. And What's happening? What else? So. I uh, I have I have a question that uh, uh, I I would like you to, to do a session a separate session on um, uh, the signs of uh, Oh, that, you are the guy who's doing PhD on on, on uh, mechanical engineering, right? Structural engineering. Yeah, structural structural engineering. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. What's up? Okay. You use uh, calculators. Yeah, so, you do everything with pencil. No, we have to use the calculator. Come on. <laughs> These days we use computers. <laughs> <laughs> okay, computers. Yes. All right. Okay. What's so, up? So, uh, what's the question? Uh, Do session on what? Um, the signs that are given in our hadith, or oh, the, uh, I heard, the I heard now AI AI does a lot of things. Do you think a lot of uh, these things that you guys do, structural engineers do, AI will take over? Yes, we are working on the, the, on those lines. Because somebody uh, somebody yeah. has been telling me. That now you could, there are AIs, you could tell them to write a story, like a film script, and they write perfect film script for you, movie script. Yes, yes. That's amazing. That's, uh, that, these are the language models, and uh, they are very so, uh, ubiquitous. They are so if, if, I, if we tell them to like, uh, do the engineering part of a, of a building, the engineering plans of a building, AI should be able to, should, should be able to make the blueprints, right? Yeah, but they will not be accurate. You still need human acumen to correct that and to yeah, and to uh, make that uh, that it can be built. Well, but then you know, if uh, <laughs> if if a human being would just review them at the end and stamp them, that means a lot of engineers will be out of business, right? Uh, yeah, in, in because some sense because now right, yeah. engineers make design everything from scratch, but if AI. AI can do everything at the end it just needs a review and probably they can make better than the engineers and at the, at the end uh, of human we in the initial years okay an engineer has to stamp it but later on probably that even that may not be necessary uh yes uh, Kibla but the thing is those AI networks will be developed by the engineers and engineers yeah, wouldn't yeah, develop I know. those networks I know, but, can, but once that AI comes into being everything. 
But once the yeah. AI comes into being, then then a lot of engineers would be out of job. That's my, that's what I think is going to happen. A big paradigm shift. Yes. Yes. Uh, at any rate, uh, yeah. You are at right, any yeah. rate, inshallah, inshallah, PhDs will be a different category. Okay. <laughs> yeah, inshallah. PhD. Inshallah, pray yeah. for me. Inshallah. inshallah. Okay. Go ahead now. And, uh, do a just, session on what? What do you want me to do a session the on? The signs that, yeah, the signs that are uh, given in our hadith uh, for the reappearance of a uh, wealthy imam. Okay. and also um, uh, advise us uh, as, a mo as a follower of Imam Ali and the 12 Imams what should we do in this era uh, so that we can uh, like how can we uh, become or how can we uh, uh, like uh, collect uh, worldly resources uh, so that his reappearance can be expedited well, I don't know about yeah, that. So you collect worldly resources to his reappearance will be expi expedited. There are no instructions in that regard. Okay. The, all you can do is pray. Other than prayers, there is no other instruction for Shias to expedite his coming. Okay. Uh, because Kibla, Kibla in, on in your one lecture, you said uh, that uh, Imam went into hiding uh, because the Shias are of, of that time didn't have those um, uh, asbab -e dunya to protect him. Well, imam -e yes, yes, they were not numerous enough, numerous enough to protect the Imam alayhi salam. That's true. Yeah, I said that. But now that he is in hiding, in hiding, they are not sincere Shia were not numerous enough to protect their Imam against all things, against all the dangers and risks and uh, threats. But uh, now, now there is no instruction for us to collect worldly capabilities so we can expedite the coming of the Imam alayhi salam. The instruction for us is to be pious, to adhere to the teachings of Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam, to promote the madhab of Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam, to serve the madhab of Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam, and to pray for the Imam alayhi salam. These, and to not to forget Imam alayhi salam. There's not any other instruction that we should do this, the Imam Ali will come sooner. There's no instruction like that. And the ulama say this, this has now become a slogan that we are expediting the coming of Imam Khomeini, expediting the ex coming of Imam. All these are slogans to deceive the Shia. Okay, brother, let me finish the session. May Allah bless you, okay? Just one That's last thing. Uh, yes, sir. Kibla, Kibla, just one yeah. last thing. So um, uh, the last thing that I want to say is uh, in one of your sessions on Khadir, you said that you have a plan to make a documentary. Uh, uh, okay. ex very comprehensive documentary on Ghadir and if you find like yeah. someone who can fund it. So yeah. if after my PhD, if I have the resources, if Allah and uh, 12 Imams and if BB Islam have permits, then uh, I, I, I'll uh, I make a promise. Inshallah. By that time, that by that time, you will you will not say. probably even like me. You will say, oh, Allah Yari says this and this. <laughs> you will move on. <laughs> 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 I have I have okay. moved on quite a lot in my life. <laughs> okay, inshallah. You, you, inshallah, you, inshallah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. People can't imagine how yeah. how much I have moved on. <laughs> okay, inshallah, inshallah, inshallah. May Allah bless you. Thank you, brother. Okay, thank you. Thank Allah you. bless thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. May Allah give you success in your studies, and may you get the one PhD and other and other. Inshallah. Okay. Okay. Hindu okay, okay, okay. Thank you. Okay, let's make this the last call then. Thank you so much, everybody. And may Allah bless you all. Allahumma salla ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad wa ajjil farajahum ushid. Allahumma kun la baliyak al hujjat ibn al hasan salawatuka alayhi wa ala ba'i fi hadis sa'a wa fi kulli sa'a. Waliyan wa hafidha wa qa'idan wa nasira wa dalilan wa aina hatta tuskinahu ardaka tawa'a. Thank you very much, everybody.